building a house or growing vegetables. Masaru is doing the same thing he did in Japan, but the only difference is that he is doing it in another world. Masaru is an ordinary middle-aged guy who does construction work in convenience stores and home centers. He mutters that he is finally done stocking everything. A man approaches him and gives him the list of today's job. Irritated, he says that he was always wondering about this and asks if this is a part of his job. The guy claims that it is a rural home center guy's job. Home center is a retail store that sells everyday goods and household hardware. He thinks that is how it should be. The store is different if it is in the countryside. When products arrive that customers request they have to deliver them, and they will also do any job that is requested. Heavy machinery repairs, garden management, they will do anything, construction surveying and so on. Thanks to that they are open every day of the year. He looks at the grateful faces of the people he has helped. He knows that he might be being exploited but he thinks that it is not all that bad, until today. He bids the guy goodbye as he carries his luggage. He grasps that staying up all night is taking a toll on him. He knows that he is old but his body is middle-aged and getting fat. On his way his vision suddenly starts to go white and gets blurry. His steps falter as he starts to collapse. All of a sudden a light is shot at him from above. He wonders where he is and notices that there is nothing but white. He feels give gloves are loose as well and the rest of his garments start to fall. He frantically grabs his pants and wonders what is going on as his body is not this thin. A voice congratulates him on being selected. A woman like an angel gently falls from the sky with feathers surrounding her. She introduces herself as the goddess Victinias. She states that Alstatia is a sword and magic fantasy world and there are a variety of magical beasts and creatures that live there. She announces that it has been decided to reincarnate him there. He wakes up to a girl with bunny ears, trying to wake him up. He unconsciously reaches for them and feels that they are real and warm and fluffy. The girl freaks out and asks him what he is doing. He stops and apologizes. He asks why she is wearing bunny ears addressing her as a young lady. She clarifies that these are not bunny ears and she is from a rabbit race. He suddenly stands up at her words and realizes what she is saying, that this is not a dream and he has reincarnated. He is in another world, Alstatia. He freaks out at the prospect of what he is going to do next. He worries about house, food, and even a toilet. He thinks starting from zero in another world is way too hard. The rabbit girl looks at him as he worries over his basic necessities. He suddenly trunks to look at her and states that there is something he wants to discuss with her. She protests that she has somewhere to go. He says if it is alright she should take him with her. She hesitates and then coldly states that if she takes him with her everyone will be mad because he is a human. Human hates non-humans and adults are mean. He perceives it like a story from a manga or game. He deliberates that perhaps slavery happens here. He concludes that in this world it's humans who do those types of things to other races. He tells her to try talking to them for him. There is a nice among the bushes and he perks up saying that someone is coming to greet them. The rabbit girl also turns around saying that there should not be anyone here. A hobgoblin emerges from the woods and the girl exclaims that there is no way that they can win against it without getting help from some adults. He questions if it is really that dangerous. He states that its body is covered in scars. She claims that it is definitely strong and dangerous if it is a stray away from its group. She pulls on his hands almost pleading for them to hurry up and get away from her. He looks at her face as tears sprinkle from her eyes he bites his lips. He stands between her and the goblin and bravely tells her to run away while he keeps the goblin's attention. She tries to refute but he continues that if it is really that dangerous she can't bring this guy with her to the village where her friends and family are. She yells at her to leave and so she does. He realizes that he doesn't really know what he is doing but states that if she shows him such a face, there is no way they can stop him. He shouts to catch the goblin's attention and is thrown backward with the power goblin's hammer. He ponders that it didn't even hit him directly. The goblin grins as it attacks again. He ponders if there is something like a skill that can be used for a time like this. He pulls something out of his bag and throws it at the goblin. He is surprised to find that it is a water bottle. It has less effect on the goblin as it starts to approach his fallen form. He thinks he is done for when the goblin accidentally steps on the fallen water bottle and falls, hitting his head on a rock on the ground and falls unconscious. He laughs and rubs the back of his head, joking if the policeman would like for him to preserve the accident site. He misses the portal that is opening by his side until it hits him. A hand comes out of it and slaps him straight on the cheek, chiding him and inquiring what he is doing. She yells that she went through great trouble to summon him near a human settlement that isn't at war, inquiring why he is so far away from it and not only that he almost got attacked by a goblin and as a result almost died. She comes out of the portal and stands on the ground. 
He looks at her properly and exclaims that it is the goddess that reincarnated him, Goddess Victinius. She stood there with a scowl on her face. She exclaimed she did not know how he was alive and questioned him why he thought she gave him all those skills. The day before the reincarnation in the goddess's room, Goddess Victinius states that she will explain everything. She says that a certain god from Earth lost a bet to her and the price he had to pay was him incarnating into a world that she manages. She pulls out a screen out of nowhere and begins confirming his identity. 36 year old at the time of reincarnation but in his 20 seconds. Works at a home center. Hobbies or games. She is interrupted by a freaked out Masaru who exclaims that all that has nothing to do with him. He claims that this is a dream. She calmly states that this is reality and of course, he has the right to refuse. That gives him a pause but she continues that he would be uneasy going to another world as things are. She draws a line with her hands and says that she will give him her blessings. She puts three skill tickets in front of him and grins. He nervously states that when she said the blessing he imagined something like a legendary weapon or magic. She happily tells him that if games are his hobbies then he should understand what skills are. He concludes he can get skills if he uses these, and she happily affirms him. She is again interrupted with a hand on her shoulder. A woman appears out of nowhere and says eight tickets. She latches onto Goddess Victinia's and gleefully says that she seems to have made a mistake. She looks at her and trembles but the other lady turns to Masaru and tells him that she is burrowing Goddess Victinia's for a second stating that she needs to talk to her for a little while. He is flustered and immediately agrees. She comes back, saying that her name is Hira. She apologizes stating that people who made the bet should apologize. Goddess Victinius is sitting on her knees, tearing up as Hira says that her husband Zeus and this idiot are sorry for the inconvenience they caused him. He recognizes Zeus and Hera from Greek mythology and gaps. Hera explains that originally in the fulfillment of a god's contract, he is supposed to be helped by being given a blessing. She says that they can make him understand the language of the new world. But after he is sent down into the new world, even gods can't interfere. She furiously turns to goddess Victinius and says that even so this girl wanted to take a cut of the blessing tickets she got by betting with her husband. She originally wanted to give him three of the eight she had. He looks buff thinking about the useless gods. Goddess Victinius covers her ears while tearing up claiming that she can't hear them. She calls out the skill slots and a machine much like a lottery machine comes out. Goddess Victinius states that even though she can grant him skills does not mean she can give him anything. She says that this is a popular way for gods to do it and this is why those are tickets. She states that if he uses 10 at once then he gets one roll extra as a bonus. Hira clapped her hands to get their attention. She says that she will give him an extra ticket for the trouble her husband caused him and Goddess Victinius will give him one extra as an apology. That way he can have 10 tickets. He happily cheers at the news. Goddess Victinius begrudgingly agrees and tells him that being able to get 11 tickets is special, and he should be honored. He needs to thank them sincerely. He says that he gets it and rolls the 11 skills with a grin on his face. Goddess Victinius wonders what kind of skill he will get. First came the appraisal 3. Hira says that he has been doing good. She has seen the data and he has been lucky so far. Two skills were masonry four. Next was the dismantling two after that mining three. Leatherworking three next is the item box. After that blacksmithing two. Next crafting three. Healing magic one. Logging one. Goddess Victinius watches in bafflement. And Goddess Hira comments that his luck makes her want to cry. All of his skill levels are low. Goddess Victinius does not even know what to say. Goddess Hira says that they are great for carpentry. He questions why those two are sweating. They brush him off saying that the granting skills ID over so let's send him down now. He questions if they are even listening to him but Goddess Victinius points her finger at him and states that those tickets need divine power to be made and it is a super rare item. It is usually only something made when a god and a human have a chili and he got ten of them. She warns him that she will never forgive him if he dies. Back to the present he tries to convince her that he has no choice but to fight. She says that she is telling him that he should act more carefully, and she asks what he meant by preserving the accident scene. She points at him again, declaring that this is not Earth so if he does not kill them they will kill him, and if he wants to survive he will have to gather his courage and do it without hesitating. She gives him the weapon that the goblin was holding. After finishing the goblin she tells him that he did well and decides to check the status, stating that all he has to do is think about opening it. He tells her not to be in such a hurry, he thinks opening status. A screen appears before him with his stats written on it. Goddess Victinius questions if he gets it now. This is a world where one can get stronger by gaining experience points. She comments that this goblin matter has become a good lesson for him. Now she will move him to the next village. He tells her to wait a minute as a girl he met here will be coming back for him. 
She comments that humans are not around here often. He puts a hand on his chin and says that it is not a human it is a bunny-eared girl. She was from the rabbit race. She exclaims that she has to get him to the human village. She is again interrupted by someone knocking at the shoulder, and she aggressively asks who it is before going pale as Hira's face comes into the picture. Goddess Hira casually says that it is good to see her warning her that she should not interfere. She drags Goddess Victinias into the portal she came from and asks Masaru with a smile if he would like to tell her what Goddess Victinias was saying. He scratches his chin and says that he is in a different world now all he has to do is live freely. The bunny girl runs towards him shouting Big Brother with people of her race who are armed with bows and arrows. The bunny girl jumps on him wrapping her arm around him and tears up. He gently calls her young lady and says that he managed to make it out safe somehow. She thanks the goddess that he is okay. The people from her race thank him for protecting Mei. They ask him where the stray goblin is, wondering if it ran away. He points at its corpus telling that it is right there. They exclaim in amazement and ask if he was alone. He rubs his hand on the back of his head and states that it was not him he just avoided the attack so he would not get killed. It fell on its own and hit its head on the rock and then he finished it off. A brief silence falls upon the group. He exclaims what he should do from now on and asks if he can live in the village with them. They smile at him and offer to talk about it on their way to the village. Another one states that if he is in trouble they have decided to help him. He almost cries tears of relief and joy. They say they will let him meet with the chief. He thanks the young lady for everything, and he tells her that she has not told her name yet. She cheerfully says that her name is May as she greets him. He pauses at her name causing her to ask if everything is alright. He states that it is nothing and introduces himself as Naryumi Masaru, and says that she can call him Masaru. They shake their hands as Masaru ponders that his path ahead is full of uncertainty, and he is not sure what he is going to do, in any case from here on living his life freely in another world beings. Narumi Masaru is 36 years old, he is traveling from the home center in the country, but on his way home he was summoned by the goddess Victinias. Regardless of what his circumstances were, she was the one who decided everything for him. His life in Alstatia has been set in stone. He has no knowledge of this world. He received 11 skills when he came into this world. A massive miss, he received no offensive skills. Right off the bat, he was attacked by a goblin. He honestly thought he was not going to make it. He puts a hand over his eyes as to cover them from the sunlight. The bunny girl, May, exclaims that they are here. Rabbit village. His life has been saved and thus his new life begins. May showed him where they lived. The people from the village greet him. May tells him that their village has a population of about 100, but they all help each other out and live their lives. She sweetly tells him that the same goes for him, addressing him as her big bother. She continues that he can think of these people as his family. He hesitantly thanks her and gazes at the village. He notices that the fences are tied together tightly with some rope. Their houses are just tents tied up with rope and a shaft to support it. He realizes that if this was Japan it would resemble the Jamin and Yeoi eras. He questions if this is a new establishment. The guard tells him that they have been here for about two years. Masasru assesses that they are struggling a lot. He tells the guard that he would like for him to meet the village chief first if that is okay. The guards happily obliged. At the rabbit village in village's chief's house, the village chiefs looked up at him and smiled, starting that he must meet Narumu Masaru. He says that he did not believe the rumor to be true but he is actually human. Masaru notices that they say he is the village chief but he looks pretty young. He bows his head and tells the village chief to let him know if he can do anything to help him out. He thanks the village chief for saving him admitting that if he was left alone he would have just gotten lost. The village chief smiles and tells him that he does not have to worry about it. The village chief states that he risked his life to save Mei, so he would also like to thank Masaru himself. He welcomes him into their village, Mei smiles widely at that. He apologizes for being hasty about this but announces that he will have Masaru live at Mei's. He pauses at that but the village chief explains that the girl's father was killed by a monster when she was young. She is currently living with her mother and he has heard they wanted a bit of help. He decides that he is fine with it but he knows that Mei is around that age and he might not like it. Mei notices his constipated face and tells him with a smile that she is okay with it as it is her big brother. Masaru mules and pates her head as he thanks her. The village chief suggests they talk about the rest tomorrow and says that the sun is already setting so go back and get some rest. Masaru apologizes again and asks if there is anything he can do in return. The village chief tells him not to worry and tells him to do whatever he can at his own pace. He ponders what he can do as he just got into this world. There should not be anything he can do. He remembers all the experiences from his previous life and the state of the village. 
he pauses and exclaims that there is something he can do. The suddenness of his statement makes both Mai and the village chief jump. He exclaims again that there is something he can do, and his skills if he thinks about it properly he can do stuff. They both look at Masaru in question. He asks the village chief if he is okay with him improving this whole village. They both pause the village chief questions him and he states that he will improve all of the systems in this village for him. He excitedly continues but the village chief stops him with a gesture of his hand, telling him that he does not this he is merely just talking about some aspirations. Masaru tries to protest but the village chief continues with a cold face that if someone who just got here started saying they want to make a place to live, it would cause quite a panic. He asks Masaru if he understands what he is saying. Masaru states that he is a bit slow in reading the room but it is better to have a safer life. He remembers an accident from the past, and even though he noticed he didn't move, he has put children and the elderly in danger. Masaru states that he would like to do what he can to make a safe daily life possible in this village. He states that if he leaves things like this he will end up regretting it later on. He would like to be someone that is helpful to everyone. He remembers that he was always scolded at work but that is the thing that let him know whenever he was doing something wrong. He exclaims that he does not know what exactly he is capable of but he would like to do his best for the sake of this village. Doing it out of pure thought even if he gets angry at him nothing will happen. He remembered that from his time working in his countryside home center, he has got a lot of hope. The village chief spreads his arms out and asks what does he intend to do first. Masaru asks if he can go right ahead, and the village chief guesses that it should be fine. He tells him that he can see his eyes he can clearly see what he truly desires. Masaru laughs saying that he was thinking about what would be good for the village, and he would like to do his best. He did tell them that but he actually needs to check on what his skills are. At Rabbit's Village Forest Gathering, when he got these skills from the slot machine, the stuff he can actually make has changed. He checks that he has some skills that he does not remember having. He wonders if these were the skills that he originally had. He decides to start with the skills that he can actually test out. He gazes at the appraisal 3, it is a simple knife, a little bit rusty, a bit unsteady when used for cutting but usable. Women are more likely to use this. He mutters that this is pretty cool. He borrowed it from me so will try not to break it. He thinks that the skills are pretty useful. He does not need any training, or experience, or knowledge. He taps on the screen and wonders what else he can use. Another info box open that states that the skill to cut trees can possibly be used without any tools. He decides to give it a try without any tools. He stands in front of a big tree and puts his hand forward. There is a little wind, gust-like movements happen and it is silent. He wonders if nothing happened but a moment later the tree falls with a clean cut on its bottom. He pants heavily, deeming it very dangerous. He thought he was going to die. He looks at his status and checks that he has 213 MP, and one-sixth of it got used. He puts a hand on his chin wondering what to do next as he could neither do physical nor housework. He concludes that he will try out the building skills. There is another info box on the status that states that MP will be taken at the cost of sculpting stones. It is possible to able to shape any type of stone into any shape desired, and it is possible to sculpt without any tools at the cost of MP. He realizes that he can use this one without any tools as well. He grabs a stone in his palm, and to start it all off he decides to try making a cube first. In the blink of an eye, the stone is turned into a cube. He notices that he has not even sanded it yet and it is already perfect. He wonders if something could happen if it gets too big. He decides to try and dry the tree he cut down earlier. He uses his skill woodworking level 4 the info box states that he can dry wood at the cost of the MP. He is able to easily cut, drill, break, and chip a tree when it has been dried. It is possible to do this without any tools. He notices that it is the same level and he can easily compare it with the other skill. He wants to use this tree as a material later. If the tree is left alone and some time passes by the tree loses its moisture and becomes dry, he thinks that it will be troublesome to use that material. If he lets it dry normally it will take about half a year to a full year. He can try doing it like a construction company would. It is not like just anyone can do it, not to mention the costs. If there are trees that take two to three years, there should be a few that only take a month or two. He wonders if his skill can do it in an instant. He puts a palm in front of the chopped tree. May calls out to him and tells him that dinner is ready so her mom tells her to get him. However, she finds him lying on the ground passed out. She freaks out as soon as she sees him. He mutters that he seems to be safe, but she yells that he looks worse than when he fought those goblins and asks what on earth did he do. He sits up as she fusses over him. He ponders if this is the mana shortage he often hears about in books. Something that Big would have been too hard on him. 
He looks at the log and notices that without straining himself he was able to dry this log. May orders that they are going back now, but Masaru guiltily says that he is ashamed of himself. Rabbit village at May's house. Her mom greets them as soon as they have entered the house or rather the tent. Masaru introduces himself to her mom. Her mom says that her name is Roru and tells him that there is no need to be formal. May immediately starts praising him and tells her mom that he has saved her and killed the goblins. Her mom merely smiles at her daughter, announcing that there is going to be a big fest tonight. May immediately perks up. Her mom calls out to him. She tells him that they don't have much but at least this house will shelter him from rain and wind. She tells him to think of this as his own house and make himself right at home. He smiles gently and mutters a grateful okay. They eat in peace and chat happily while falling asleep. He thinks that thanks to the kindness of these rabbit people, he can live in this other world. From here on out he will start this new life. He honestly has no clue just how much he can do for them but he will do whatever he can do with all his might. To say it straight it will begin starting tomorrow this village's important plan. At the rabbit's village entrance on Wednesday. After giving a lot of thought the building process is finally starting. A guard asks if this is okay. Samurai says that first things first, they are going to reinforce this force. The guard says that he has heard about the most of his plans from the chief. He has heard that Samaru is planning to make improvements to this place. Other guards agree stating that he has been excited since he woke up. He questions why they are starting with the fence. Samurai says that he was thinking that they should prioritize safety. He continues that this way even if he gets attacked by the monsters, they will not suffer from any serious damage, even if the goblins were easy enough to take down. Samurai starts explaining that he wants to build a stone guard, from the root of the wood to the ground under. They can use as many stones from nearby cliffs as much as they want. If they built it using that the fence will be much stronger. The guards praise that it sounds amazing. A guard voices that the fence goes all the way around the village and they will have to collect an absurd amount of stone. They simply don't have enough manpower for that. Masaru quickly says that this will not be an issue as he already went to the cliff with Mei this morning and brought some with him. He raises his hands in front of him and his palm glows. He uses his skill item box to carry out dozens of stones as the rest of the guards watch his actions in amazement. He says that is not a problem anymore. The guards exclaim in wonder that he has an item box. They gossip that they heard it was a common skill, that there is someone in each town who has one. Masaru looks bummed at that and other guards chide him saying that Masaru probably has his reasons. They apologize quickly and Masaru wonders what they are talking about. He questions if it is really that unusual. It did not seem that rare as a skill when he first got it. He decides that he probably should not show off this skill too much. He tells them to start off by moving these stones and get to building the wall. They agree immediately and begin lifting the stones. They pick each stone and tell him that they will be the ones carrying them all. Seeing this he hurriedly tells them to hold on for a moment. He says that if they start by placing them like this they will crumble. The guards question if they need to be placed in a specific way. Masaru puts a hand on his chin and says to let him try something out. He puts them up in a specific sequence, building a wall. He states that there are a lot more smaller stones than what they had before. The villagers claim that if it is like this even a small attack could probably take down the wall. Masaru says that it may seem like that on the outside but the important thing is what is being the rocks. The villagers question him so he explains that it is not like the stones are piled up like this are actually smaller or anything. There is a reason for making these gaps. While placing the stones on each other, he says that making sure that the gaps are even will make the wall steadier and less likely to fall. The villagers say that simply putting it up will not do and another asks if there is anything else that they should be doing. Masaru says that if the attacks start getting bigger they would have to use pebbles then, placing the bigger stones on the outside and pebbles on the inside. If they do that, the rainwater will not become a problem, as it can just pass through easily. He continues that it will keep its strength even while it is raining. That is why it would be a great idea to use pebbles. He says that these are just basic techniques. They will be making the wall stronger. He suggests to try and make it so there are no gaps in between them. He announces that he will teach everyone the proper ways of making a good wall. He states that he will be in their care. He then awkwardly tells them that he is not good at teaching. The women from the village approached him and stated that they wished to know how did he came up with such a wonderful stuff out of thin air. He says that he does not mind since everyone is helping out anyway, right now. He is mostly just gathering some stuff to help them out with their food. He says that he heard that they only use fire for cooking. He was thinking of making a furnace to help with the cooking. The women almost jump on him as they ask if he is going to make them right after he makes it safer. He knows that it is not a question but an order. These are the demons of the kitchen, women. He knows that he probably should not get on their bad side. 
he salutes them saying that he will be using the stones to make the furnace, so it should be no problem at all. The women all smile happily saying that he understands how difficult it is to cook. He looks away with a wary smile. At the field, he states that he will be making the furnace, and he will be the one doing most of the heavy lifting but still asks them to help him out just a bit. He asks if this is alright and they all happily agree. He says that he will need quite a few more materials to make this. The ladies ask him besides the stones what else he needs. He plainly states that he needs clay, grass, and sand. He explains that they can use it to strengthen the structure, and that it will be much easier than using stones. The ladies say that they get using clay can help but wonder out loud why they need grass and sand. He says that he will be mixing it into the clay. The clay is not strong so it would be a weak structure on its own. But when is it mixed with the grass and sand in there, it will form a bond and it will make it much stronger. A lady gasped in wonder saying that she did not know that. Masaru called out that they could get started with a few people. They immediately answer to him. He tells the ladies to feel free to ask him anything else, and if it is something he can help it, he will gladly do it. A lady says that it would be nice to have forks and spoons for the entire rabbit village. They also added that they would need some tables and chairs. They continue suggesting stuff as Masaru ponders that he is a bit worried about the amount of mana it would use. He thinks that he should still be able to pull it off with his skills. He agrees exclaiming that it might take him a couple of days, but he is sure that he can do it. He suggests making this a roofed area so that every once in a while they could all have a meal here together. They pause and he questions if there is something wrong. They smile and tell him that it is just the fact that he knows so much and that he has amazing skills in building, so everyone is impressed. He scratches the back of his head stating that it is stuff that he remembers from the work. The young ladies jump on him this time with a sparkle in their eyes, claiming to be curious about what kind of work he did back then. He profoundly says that it is just normal work. Just working as a normal person would, at a countryside home center. He announces that they are going to make lots of things together, so he will need everyone to help as much as possible too. All the ladies cheer at this announcement. They built the village together, along with the houses, and kitchen products. They cook and eat together. The ladies' eyes sparkle when they see him eating with chopsticks. The village chief smiles at the scene. He looks at the completed stone backfield wooden fence and exclaims that they did it. The villagers also look at the wall in amazement and shock that they have finally completed it. That is when the ladies call them and tell them to stop cheering and come eat dinner. The field is turned into a gathering place with chairs and tables available for service. The ladies tell Masaru that this furnace is really strong and super helpful. He says that seeing all of them happy is enough for him. He notices that it seems like everyone likes to use the chopsticks he made. It may be a bit that forks are not being used as much now. The village chief calls to him. He tells Masaru that everything that is going on right now is all thanks to him. He humbly tells him that he did not do anything by himself. The village chief tells him that he needs to say these words from his own mouth as he says a grateful thanks on behalf of the people in the village. Nay hangs on him again telling him that his plan was a massive success. Masaru smiles widely at that. In God's realm both the goddess watches him live his life. Hira comments that even if they don't do anything, everything is still going fine. She tells Goddess Vuktuinus that what she did was not really necessary. However, Goddess Vuktuinus turns her head away like a child claiming that everything is fine and she is not wrong for anything. She says that she gave him 11 skills and Hira can't tell him not to worry. Goddess Hira slowly agrees siping his tea she comments that he who obtained more skills, he should not exist anymore. Goddess Vuktuinus questions her if she has noticed as well. Hira says that she saw at Zeus place. The skills a normal person should have from the start is normally one or two. She offhandedly says that she does not wish to congratulate that man and asks Goddess Vuktuinus what she should do. Goddess Vuktuinus hisses at her that she knows that she hates this. This world has been going on for more than 400 years now and nothing has happened within all this time. She continues that if this happens they will need Masaru to take the role of their detonator. The village chief praised Masaru at the gathering place where he sat beside Mei. He claims that he told him that he would be able to live a safe life here and now thanks to him now it is safer than before. Masaru tells him that it is not all that much work and he has more things planned. He starts with strengthening the houses with slabs of wood. He says that this place will become a city. He suggests on making a toilet but abruptly stops himself. The village chief looks at him in question. Masaru ponders that he should not talk about this right now but a toilet he needs to hurry up and make one. He knows that this is a fantasy world. He announces that he wants to question them about something. He asks what are the slimes nearby. All the people around him come to a halt and look at him in shock. May exclaims if he is talking about the ministers. He concludes that there are some. 
She claims that the monsters are dangerous as they can melt anything. Her mother tells him that she is right, but says not to worry since they live under the cliff they can't climb up there. He grins as it is just as he expected, it is good they can't climb up the cliff. His current issue is explaining hygiene to everyone. He also wants to make sand with soil and he would need materials to do that. He knows that cement is probably not the best choice then. Sanwa soil is just soil composed of three materials. On TV he saw a group of people trying to make it from the scratch. They use gravel and sand which means. He asks one more question. He inquires if there is an ocean nearby. A dull silence sets upon the group and Masaru wonders what happened. May answers looking down that there is one ocean but everyone here ran away from there. The village chief answers his question with a difficult expression that southwest from here is about 10 days worth of travel. He says that they used to live there. They were driven away from that place by humans. He grimaced just as he thought something like that had actually happened. Despite that, all of the rabbit people here were able to accept a human like him in staying here. He rubs the back of his head and apologizes that he asked for something strange and completely ruined the mood. But he continued that he felt in debt towards making this place better for everyone. In order for him to do that, he will need to gather some materials near the ocean. But he says that they only have bad memories of that place so he will not be asking them for any help. He declares that he plans to go there by himself to the ocean. The next morning at Rabbit Village entrance, he chides May who sits before him with a solemn face hands tied behind her back. He says that he has already told her and asks her why she is so adamant about coming with him. He yells that it's because she wants to come with him. He asks if she plans to leave her mother all by herself. Besides she can't even fight at all, she needs to be able to at least take down a goblin. She points out that she is the same too as he was only able to beat those goblins because they tripped on their own. He looks away from her. The village chief tells her to listen to what Masaru is saying. She can't tag along because she can't fight at all. He has already told her not to test her strength on things that can kill her. Masaru tells the village chief that he is the same as he also told him that he did not need to send him off. The village chief says that there is something he wants to give him and he wants to ask him for a favor. He unties his bundle of luggage and asks if Masaru could wear this. Masaru watches in amazement that it is an armor. The village chief continues that the favor he wanted to ask Masaru was this if he runs into humans who live in that village. Let them know that they are living here safely. Masaru happily says that he understood and he will not forget it. With that, he needs to investigate what happened over there and find out what really happened. He says that he will leave Hal to them, and he requests them to not be too excited with what he ends up bringing back. He sees May trembling and tells her that she has to be a good girl and stay at home. She cries even more. With that, he declares that he will be off. He jogs past the forest. It has been four days since he has started training, and he has become level six since then. He found sightseeing while running to be amusing. Using the map skill he was able to get here by following a path. He yells that he can see it. On the way, the day before, he was attacked by bandits. They claimed that someone had toppled their carriage and tricked him. Even so, comparing this to the first time he ever fought which was against goblins. He looks at the fallen form of the bandits. He muses that these guys were pretty weak. He fought back using the club that he got earlier. Regardless, he remembers the goddess Vuktuinus's words that people have no rights is something one would see in a Bible. He raises the club to hit the fallen man but ends up using his healing skill to heal his injuries. He huffs that even a person like him cannot bring himself to kill another person. And just like that he lets them go. And he took the potions and herbs that they had in their possession. He was able to acquire some weapons that he had been wanting. In exchange, they were able to keep their lives so it is a win-win situation. A screen appears in front of him and he notices that he got a signal on the map. Which means that is the town may used to live in. He looks at the hoses in front of him. He decides that before he enters he should disguise himself to look like an adventurer. He notices and finds it strange that the tower is empty and the entrance looks like it has been attacked by a beast. Goblins were coming out of the houses that the humans had built. He freaks out and says that the goblins are in the middle of working overtime. He says that even if he excuses himself they will not listen to him. They rush to attack him with their clubs in their hand he drops his luggage and curses them, yelling to come at him. These are the types of goblins that tend to stick together. Even though some of them are small they still have their numbers. But now he has this, he opens his item box and pulls out his sword, swiftly cutting the goblin in half. He has no choice but to do this. The thing he got from the bandits is a sword. Even if he does not have any good offensive skills or magic he still has swordsmanship for. Another goblin attacks him and takes him by surprise. This was not a skill he received. This was the skill he already had. This was the kendo he used to do as a kid. He questions if that means it can be recognized as a skill. 
He does a wrist strike, even though he can't use kendo as a way to kill. He has not done it in a while either. He takes down another goblin. He thinks he can do it and he does not mind the weight of the sword. It can continue. Suddenly he is in front of a huge demon who seems to be on top of a boar. He wonders if this is the village boss and what he can do to win against him. He steps out of the way in time to dodge the attack. It rushes forward with its attack, barely missing Masaru as he notices how fast the demon is. He curses and thinks if only he can do something about the goblin riding the boar, but his sword can't reach him. If that is the case, he needs to do something about the boar but at that speed, it will only end up with his arms getting ripped off. That would become a minor traffic accident right here. He looks at the rocks falling around them. He realizes that like a speeding car, he can't stop immediately. He pulls out the log from his item box and throws it in front of the speeding boar. This is a leftover wood from the construction. He thinks that will stop him. He stabs him with his sword. The goblins hesitate to attack after this. He comments that all that is left is small fries. They run away from him as he watches the scene, worrying that they run and call back up. But all the goblins are killed by arrows as the vice captain of the Grotta's kingdom army approaches him. He commands Samuru to identify himself. Samuru stands before the army of the Grotta's kingdom who tell him to identify himself. Another soldier yells at him but the commander tells him to calm down. He apologizes for his knight's rudeness and introduces himself as General Cook. He tells Masaru that they came here to exterminate the goblins but it looks like they were a little late. He questions if Masaru did this all by himself. Masaru affirms him and thanks him for saving him. He tells the General Cook that he came here looking for resources. He realizes that this is the kingdom that took over the village. He concludes that these guys might know something about the rabbit village. But the problem is how will he ask them? The soldier asks if he is out of his mind as the general tells him that the report says that there was a goblin rider. Another soldier says that he is surprised as it is an opponent that they can't really take down. They comment that he looks like a local villager and ask if he came from villages close to here. They frantically interrogate and ask about his job and how old he is or if he has any skills. The general clears his throat telling him that he does not need to say yes, but adds that since he has tremendous strength he asks if Masaru would like to become a knight. There it is he thinks he saw it in the manga that he would get promoted from the start. Even so, he kindly refuses saying that he already has a role and a purpose. And thanks to that he has come all the way here. General Cook pats his shoulder repeatedly making it itch. He praises him for having such a strong will. Money, women, wealth and fame. He wants other soldiers to look up to him. When he stops Masaru asks where did everyone go. General Cook tells him that they should be sheltering nearby. He orders a soldier to call the villagers. Masaru tells him that he would like to clear all the corpses and asks if General Cook can lend a hand. General Cook asks what he wants to do with them. Masaru explains that leaving their bodies here might lure monsters and wolves. It might cause illness if their bodies rot. So he says that they should put them in a hole, burn them, and then bury them. General Cook says that he will get his men to gather the bodies. He realizes that the soldiers have to follow those sorts of orders. He wonders if they have that low of a role outside their kingdom. Besides that, he needs to find a spot to bury the goblins. He looks around. He muses that it would be nice if there were an open space nearby. He looks between two buildings there is a gap ally and he walks there. He exclaims what is going on here at what he sees. At the god's realm, they see him shouting that. The lady worriedly says that she does not know, and they should ask goddess Hira. Hira tells her to go back a bit. She says that goblins are weak but they should still be able to kill Masaru. And the group's leader was a goblin rider. There is no way he could have taken down a rider. Goddess Hira wants to see the documents and goddess Vuktuinus agrees. Ranked top 8 in kendo in 3rd grade, in high school, came 2nd in boxing for states. She says that he seems pretty normal for a summoned person. Goddess Vuktuinus asks if something happened when God Zeus gave him his body. Goddess Hira exclaims that she figured it out. She tells Goddess Vuktuinus that Masaru's body was a little strange when he was summoned. She questions what is wrong when she looks at Goddess Vuktuinus's expression. She exclaims that to thinks this will happen. Goddess Hira yells at her for being so calm exclaiming that this is a dangerous situation. She tells her that this is the worst case scenario. She said she wanted him to be a detonator or whatever. But if she leaves him like this this world will be destroyed. The villagers thank the knights saying that they can free live here now. General Cook claims that he is glad they are safe. The village person comments that at this rate they can go back to work and he thanks him again from the bottom of his heart. General Cook tells him that he is not wrong but he pints at Masaru and tells them that this person took down all the goblins. General Cook suggests instead of forming a contract with them they should give Masaru something as a reward. 
Masaru scratches his cheek saying that if he says so he will not refuse. The villager hesitates saying that as he can see the village is in ruins so he will not be able to give Masaru anything so he suggests General Cook give him something. Masaru pauses and tells them that they can help him even without giving anything. He tells that that he does not need money, and asks for some water bottles and wooden boxes. General Cook asks if he is fine with that. Masaru explains that he needs to collect seawater and seashells. General Cook remembers that he came here looking for resources and asks if that was his real goal. Masaru tells him that he can't really explain it but it is for a dirt wall. General Cook addressed the villager as Garb and tells him as a thanks for saving the village he should give him what he wants. Garb is deep in thought for a moment and says that wooden boxes are fine but they need jugs to carry the water from the ocean to the village and they can't lose those. Marusu thinks that this village chief if it has come to this he will give him a bit of a reason. He smiles and tells the village chief that he does not need to carry water to the village. He smiles pointing out that they have a well, just one next to the garden. The village chief grabs Masaru's collar and asks him how does he know that. He says that he just saw it past the small alley. The soldiers inquire the village chief as he sweats buckets. They ask if the village was not out of water in Cropolis. They exclaim that he should have told them about the well. A hand grabs Masaru and a villager horridly asks him why did he do that with a sickle in his hands, and exclaims what he will do if the village gets erased. He says that they should be attacking the chief. The villager raises the sickle exclaiming that he is the one who told the knights. Masaru moves just in time to avoid getting slashed but the villagers curse at him and all of them attack. General Cook looks bitterly at the scene exclaiming that he did this while they were talking talking. Masaru looks elsewhere avoiding looking at the fallen villagers. He smiles explaining that they suddenly attacked him and the goblins were harder. General Cook hisses that he did too much and what chaos did he cause. He bets that they attacked him because he revealed their secret. They did not only plan to kill him but also to keep their secrets. He looks down at now now tied up guilty villagers and asks him what he is going to do now. General Cook says for hiding the well and farm and attacking someone. He would normally execute those responsibly or turn them into slaves. The villagers looked scared now. They plead to him for mercy. Masaru thinks and then smiles. He tells them to wait and says that if they agree to his terms he will forget this happened. He asks General Cook that if he forgets what happened they will not be punished. General Cook agrees saying that if the victim says so. The village chief begs Masaru and what the conditions are. He tells them to answer to a few questions it will be depending on their answers. General Cook darkly asks him what he is planning but he merely smiles and begins questioning. He states that two years ago this village was owned by rabbit people what happened to them. The village chief's face grows pale. He stammers and asks what he is planning and asks the knights if they are allowing such type of interrogation. General Cook asks if there is something wrong. A knight stands in front of the village chief and tells him to stop. Grave looks up at him calling him Eldam. Masaru wonders why the knight covered the chief. The knight asks why he is asking about something that happened two days ago. Masaru says that if he answers his question there are people who believe in him. The knight concludes that those people are rabbit people. Masaru surveys that those two know something. Eldam states that he will talk to him, but the village chief protests, but he does not listen to him. Eldam tells Masaru that he is strong and even he would lose to him. He starts explaining that it all started five years ago. The last king expanded the country absorbing all the nearby states. One of those states was this village, grave and he fought in the battle for this village and won. After that, the rabbit people ran. They took the land as they ran away and grave was made the chief of the village. Masaru dreadfully realizes that it was a country and it was not captured by pirates, a country the humans did it. All of the rabbit people got forced out. He asks what happened to the rabbit people that did not run. He questions if they were captured or taken in as slaves. Even today some of the rabbits still mourn over the ones that were taken away. He jabs his finger at Eldam telling him to release all the rabbit people right now. General Cook tells him to calm down as he puts his hands on his shoulder, saying that he gets that he is upset but claims it to be impossible. They cannot be released immediately. Masaru says that if he defeats all of them they can take their place as their slaves. General Cook tells him that he can't do something like that, while he was the one who took innocent rabbit people as his slaves. General Cook tries to explain that they can't do anything about that as the law will not allow them to. Masaru yells that if they follow the law they can take anyone they want as slaves. He tells them to not screw with him. He curses at them calling them murderous invaders and telling them that they have no right to talk about justice. Silence befalls them and he walks away apologizing for raising his voice as he tells them that he will give them some time. He looks at them and tells them to decide on what they are going to do. 
he does not notice the portal opening by his sides until after he is hit by the slap of the goddess Vuctuinus. She asks what he thinks he is doing. She drags him and tells him to follow her. She states that she brought him here to save the world. She asks what he was trying to do by yelling at them and telling them to fight him. She inquires if he is trying to destroy the country and make her cry. She exclaims if he hates her that much. He plainly states that he does not hate her, saying that she brought him here without his consent and he could not meet the love of his life because of that as well. His jabs are perfectly landed as the goddess glares at him. She tells him to not do anything else and to lay low for a bit. He tells her that he really can't do anything. He tells her that they will not fight him anyway exclaiming that he cannot take on an entire army. She sweats and tells him that of course he cannot do that, making it an obvious lie. He wonders if this is bad. He stops her in her tracks and asks if she knows what is going on with his body. She grumbles and tells him that in simple terms he can fight an entire army alone. He questions what she means and she further explains that when he was reincarnated they had to adapt his body with magic because of that his aptitude for magic is much higher. They accidentally overdid it a little and his magic recovery in particular is spirit class. He rubs the back of his head and states that he does not know anything about that. Goddess Vuctuinus says that it means he is on the same level as creatures made of magic. She says that it is amazing. For example, running will barely tire him, magic is much easier to control, and his physical strength is far beyond what it should be. He dreadfully thinks that he might have experienced some of that already. She says that he is still at a low level right now. As he increases his magic, the ace of his magic recovery will increase, alongside all other states. He states that just as he thought something was definitely off, he tells her that she has done quite a few things without considering his situation. Goddess Vuctuinus apologizes to him and he looks at her in wonder exclaiming before she disappears again. Next, say early morning, the knights approach him and General Cook wakes him up. He says judging by their expressions he is assuming they agreed to release them. General Cook states that the villagers were pretty reluctant. Nonetheless, General Cook asks him when he meant release if he meant all of the beast's folk. He questions if he knows any other places that won't give in so easily. Masaru says that setting that aside if he knows the beast folk situation in other villages, like their numbers and species. General Cook tells him that they have records in their city. Masaru states that after this they will go to there and meet the people in charge. General Cook hesitates and Masaru asks what is wrong. He answers that he is relieved that Masaru is a lot less tense. Masaru says that something happened last night and he is just glad that negotiations went well. General Cook asks what he means and Masaru says that honestly, he was thinking that if negotiations did not work out he would have to just work something out with his fists. Both soldiers exclaim for him to not do it. General Cook tells him that they have set up a meeting to avoid fighting. Masaru agrees and tells him to get the carriage because they are heading to our city. He questions what their city is like. General Cook starts that it is the City of Knights, the base of Greta's kingdom's coastal knights. Masaru looks at the kingdom in wonder and awe. The map of Powderham at the City of Knights, he says is expected of a knight base. There are a lot of properly built houses. The guard muses if that is supposed to be a compliment. General Cook says that it is quite a fortress city but they can give any attacker a run for their money. After all, this is a city of knights. Masaru thinks this as well but he thought as much in the fishing village but the concept of sanitation does not really exist here. If this is the standard, he really does not wish to live here. He mutters if that is the case then I might be able to do something about the release of the beast folk. The other soldiers gather muttering that he has a bad feeling about this. He tells Masaru they are currently heading towards the assembly hall. They will need to check his identification at the front gate. General Cook informs him that he will be meeting the boss after all. Of course, this kind of check is necessary. He requests Masaru to prepare for a guilt card. Masaru sweats and turns around at the adventure guilt. He yells at him asking why does he not have one. He says that he is one of those people who slack off on getting a card. Everyone knows he is supposed to register at the guild when they turn 12. He thinks he is saved. He thought he was done for but is saved by General Cook's misunderstanding. The attendant thanks him for waiting and informs him that lastly, he will have to place his hands on this magic tool, puts his hand on it and it starts to glow. He claims that it is amazing when he sees that it is automatically making a card. She tells him that the guild cards are a technology granted to them by the gods. She requests him to also be aware that fraud and forgery are serious crimes punishable by law. She tells him that personal information can be hidden, however, his name, guilt of registration and his criminal record cannot be hidden. Additionally, this information can only be for the purpose of identification. 
As long as the owner is alive it is not possible to obtain detailed information. Marusu says that it is surprising to have his personal information properly secured. They hand him his card and they inform him that this will be his guild card. The guard tells him that he seems like he has got it and tells him to show them. Identity confirmation also means also means showing all of his information. Masaru says that he should just touch it and think show everything. He realizes that it resembles a status screen after all it was made by a god. He does not realize the awestruck faces of the army soldiers around him. They curse at him and ask what is going on after looking at his screen. He wonders if it is normal to have this number of skills. He rushes to hide his skill selection. He smiles and hands his card over saying that he might have made a mistake. They tell him not to give him that look like nothing happened. The guards whisper on their own about his skills and he gives them a solemn look. They freak about the title that this is the first time they have seen it and he even has five of them. He yells at them to forget everything. The point is he saw that he was not a spy. He screams that this is good enough and he requests them to overlook this. The guards tell him that it is not like anyone will believe him. And they might even be deemed as liars and punished. They look at each other in silence for a minute. The soldiers say that there is an emergency meeting they need to figure out what they are going to put in the report. He orders Masaru to make sure that he gets the story straight. At the assembly hall, a girl says that it seems everything is in order and they have been expecting Masaru. As she informs him to visit the first meeting room, the guards move away with a grim look on their faces, muttering that somehow they made it. Masaru says that he is suddenly very tired. General Cook tells him that he will soon be meeting the representative of this city who is also the leader of the knights. Normally he would not be able to arrange a meeting this quickly but he mutter that sounds interesting he will allow it were his words apparently. He announces that this is Cook and he has brought the person he mentioned. He gets the permission to enter. The leader of the army looks grimly at him and introduces himself as Lancelot. He is the man who rules over the city. Masaru notices that his aura is completely different from the other knights. Maybe this negotiation will not be as easy as he has thought. Masaru politely starts that he would humbly thank him for providing him with this opportunity. But he is interrupted by the leader who states that there is no need for to beat around the bush as he has been informed of his purpose in coming here. He says that he is here because he asks if he has come here personally to negotiate the release of the beast folk. In other words, it comes down to what he is willing to offer in exchange for release. He informs him that from the looks of it, he does not seem to have the intention to offer money or items to trade, and he is truly curious to see what kind of offer he will make him next time. Masaru realizes he is way more calm and more logical than he thought he would be, and this is going to be a tough one. Trying to deceive him would probably backfire badly. In this case, the best option is to lay his cards bare and confront him head on. Masaru says that his offer is knowledge. A leader tells him to explain further. Masaru elaborates that with this knowledge he can reduce the death rate and improve the food situation. He also plans to increase the number of jobs as well as the productivity and quality of life here. The guards question him and he continues that to give a more concrete example the horse's carriages are the first thing he would like to improve. Masaru explains that when he was riding he noticed that it shook quite a bit when it moved. He explains that in other wards a mechanism that can absorb shocks and vibrations. None of the carriages in the city have them. The guards question if he wants to create a carriage that does not shake. Samaru explains that this is not exactly what she meant but it will be many themes smoother than what they have. Furthermore rather than having the horses go bare hoofed. The attendant calls to Lancelot seemingly agreeing on something. He turns to talk to Masaru and says that he understands what he is offering. It seems like the kind of thing this city will eventually need and he is sure it can bring about fantastic improvement if this knowledge yields results. However, hesitates that he cannot trust him right away and he cannot put his trust in something he cannot see nor touch. He tells Masaru that he makes a very convincing offer, but only small towns or villages would outright accept his offer. Therefore he will have Masaru stay in the city until he can see clear results. Masaru concludes that in other words, he wants him to join the knights. Lancelot points out that he already declined when Cook asked him. He says that it is a shame to lose out on someone like him but they have already accepted that he will not be joining. Lancelot says that what he means is that until he sees results, the beast folk will remain in their custody. If he does not see results then Masaru either continues to stay here until he can produce them or die a meaningless death. He declares that Masaru will not just offer his knowledge but his potential future as well. Masaru is silent for a minute before uttering so be it. That makes everyone in the room pause and look at him in shock. Lancelot breaks the silence as he snickers before stating that in that case, he will have Masaru improve two aspects of this city. 
the sanitation and the horse carriages. He continues that as soon as he sees even a small improvement in these two areas he will hand over the beast folk to him. He informs Masaru that he can discuss the details with his secretary. He looks at Masaru's absent-minded expression and asks if there is something wrong. Masaru explains that he is nothing is wrong and he is just surprised by how good these conditions are. Lancelot tells him that he is looking at it the wrong way and grins widely. With this, Lancelot can get rid of those beast folks that could start a rebellion any day, and he even gets the benefit of his knowledge. From his point of view, he is getting a great deal. He sternly states that they also resent the act of invading and pillaging and calling it a war. Masaru smiles musing that the leader of this city is not a bad person after all. Lancelot states that he will prepare to gather the scattered beast folks. He claims that the real problem is the people who will oppose the release of beast folks. He questions if Masaru has any ideas about it. He looks startled at being addressed before smirking and voicing that he has a devilish idea. Lancelot returns the same energy and smirk retailing that he likes devilish ideas. The attendant looks at the scene in worry. He suggests settling it with a duel, after all, it is a city of knights. Masaru verses all the people against releasing the beast folks at the same theme and the loser will have to accept the outcome without complaining. Lancelot exclaims that this is a great idea as he gets up and says that he will be sure to put on a good show too. He looks at their reflection on his sword before continuing that even then there will be plenty of idiots who will not know how to shut down and accept defeat. However, if their opponent is the strongest person in the city and the one who defeats them is the one releasing the beast folk he is sure they will accept it. In the middle of saying all that he had proceeded to pull off his sword from its shed startling both Masaru and his attendant. Masaru catches on as he tries to say something but is cut off by Lancelot who exclaims that small fries like that can only fight goblins at best, they will not be able to see his full strength like that. He excitedly proposes a spar with Masaru. Lancelot excitedly proposes a spare to Masaru who is startled at the sword pointed at him. Masaru assessed that the moment Lancelot picked up his sword his eyes started shining. He wonders if this guy is a battle junkie. Masaru respectfully declined he thinks a lot of problems would arise if the person in charge of the city were injured. Lancelot's eyes are practically shimmering with delight as he exclaims that Masaru thinks that he will win. Lancelot says that it is decided and orders to make sure the training grounds are available. His attendant is still in shock as another soldier exclaims that he will do it. Masaru grumbles that he is putting words into his mouth and reluctantly agrees that he will do it and let him know when the theme and date are set. Lancelot states that he will look forward to it. Returning to the topic he asks Lancelot that it may be sudden but is there a place he can begin. Lancelot questions him and Masaru explains that right now he would like to give everyone a lecture on hygiene. Everyone looks at him in the sudden change of atmosphere. Lancelot questions if this is the study session he mentions. Masaru affirms and states that he will be teaching them why it is important to maintain good hygiene, what kind of practices to avoid and how to improve and maintain sanitation standards, which is why he would like to gather everyone available. A soldier stands up and exclaims that in that case he will go ahead and fetch his smartest subordinate available. Many others also start to stand up. Masaru grins wickedly stating that everyone who does not attend will receive a makeup lecture. There is a loud chorus of disgruntled noises at that. He tells them not to hug him, explaining that even if the higher-ups who are at this meeting don't show up for the lecture, it will set a bad example for everyone else. Lancelot says that it looks like he has everything handled here. He excuses that he will leave everything to Masaru and that if he needs Lancelot he will be at the training grounds. Masaru peskily calls him out too. In the lecture, Masaru continues that in summary, the biggest problem they face is the lack of sanitary practices. As he has explained, feces and urine are breeding grounds for insects and pests. When eaten by rats and birds they carry and spread the diseases quickly. He informs that he will say it again, always boil the water before drinking it, meat must be cooked before eating and make sure to clean their homes and wash their clothes decently. Everyone sat there with a difficult expression on their faces. Masaru muses that he has only talked about the things that even a primary schooler would know, but from the looks on their faces, it seems like there is a lot for them to learn. Lancelot compliments that he did not expect Masaru to give a lecture so suddenly. He questions if he really thinks that these things can make such a difference. Masaru smiles and answers that if they are able to properly maintain a clean environment he should see death rates drop across the board for everyone in the city, from newborns to adults. He suggests that it may even be possible to stop the outbreak of plagues. He may not be particularly knowledgeable in the field of medicine, but he would be happy to share what he knows. Lancelot questions who he really is before continuing that regarding the plague it has not reached the kingdom yet and hence it is so dangerous there is barely anyone who is willing to research it. 
Any information big or small about the plague is extremely important. He states that this deal is extremely unbalanced. Masaru questions Lancelot at his silence. He tells Masaru to let him know if he needs any help. He will not go as far as to say they will do anything but states that they will do their best to lend him their strength. Samaru says that it should be fine since he is on the benefiting side. But Lancelot states that this will not do after all allowing oneself to be indebted to others just isn't very professional. Then grins. Masaru considers him a refreshing man and decides that it would be bad manners to hold back after hearing that. So he says in that case, he might have something he might need help with and asks if it would be possible for Lancelot to lend him a smithing workshop from tomorrow onwards. He continues that he needs to get started on those improvements for the horse carriages, and there are a lot of other things he wants to try too. Lancelot easily agrees and says that he will make arrangements for him to be able to start using it tomorrow. He continues that there is nothing wrong with that workshop but says that they don't have any blacksmiths here. After all, this is just a coastal base. All the good craftsmen have long been placed by the capital because of that. At the City of Knights, Pauterium Smithing Workshop. Samurai Hayes was shocked to see the state of the empty workshop. Lancelot unabashedly says that they have mountains of unused materials piled up and he can see it for himself. Masaru weakly says that he needs people and anyone will do it. Lancelot says pardon before Masaru bursts out that he wants to take inventory of everything here by the end of the day. He claims that this place is unacceptable and this can hardly be called a workshop. Lancelot questions about inventory. Masaru ignores him and states that he wants a full list of the materials here. He wants to know what they have and how much of each material there is. He adds that he wants a record of the broken items, degradation of materials, or other abnormalities. Not to mention the cleaning. Lancelot tells him to hold on for a minute. He says that they are still military and have at least been doing the bare minimum of keeping this place organized. Masaru viciously asks why everything is not organized and why is there so much dust. For someone like Masaru who has worked at a home center, this kind of sloppiness is especially unforgivable. When one has tens of thousands of products and equipment in their inventory at any one theme, a single error in their catalog can mean countless hours of searching for items for looking for irregularities. He orders Lancelot to take care of the back, bring men, and get this place in order. Lancelot ishitantly agrees to the sudden unexpected bark of an order. He pulls his glove and declares that he will teach them the true meaning of inventory management. They readjust the materials and work day and night that is when Masaru finally exclaims that it looks a lot better here now. He makes a face looking at the materials. He knows what copper and then are, but he wonders what black steel is here for. He has no idea what to do with these fantasy materials. He wonders out loud that there is too much stuff here. He questions how are these cities' finances are being handled. The attendant states that it pains him to say this but there is still more to come. Masaru questions why is that, and the attendant answers that they have a long-term contract to buy these ores. He bitterly informs him that it had been in place before he even came to this city. There is still one more year before the contract expires. Masaru suggests that they better start turning some of these ore into ingots then. They should at least get it into a form that they can use. He puts a hand on his chin and voices that there are so many materials he is not familiar with here. He bets that if he experiments a bit, he can make some good alloys from this stuff. The attendant asks what the alloys are. Masaru explains that for example if one mixes copper and then one can make a metal known as bronze. They can use it to make armor too. It will be a lot stronger than copper, but not as strong as iron. That is what an alloy is. Masaru adds that he would personally like to try making stainless steel for that he needs iron and chromium. The attendant overwhelmed by his lecture tells him to slow down and asks what he is getting at. Masaru wondered if that was a little too hard to understand, and questions himself about how should he explain it. He says that in other words when a metal is of strength or has properties that are not needed, he can mix it with other metals to form an alloy with new properties that he can use. Hayes slowly states that there are formulae and proportions to follow of course so he can't just mix things randomly. The attendant wonders at the existence of such a technique. He concludes if he did it badly he would just be wasting materials, he excuses himself saying that he needs to organize the inventory documents. Masaru waves him goodbye. He looks back at his cleaned up inventory with a smile. He tries experimenting with something. He tries smithing skills. The screen of his status opens with the details written on it. The details were, the ability to process metals. Metals will also be repaired when processed and it can be used without tools at the cost of magic. Below it was written that ingots can be created, molded, cut, combined, or otherwise shaped and shapes that are not physically possible cannot be created. Masaru wonders if that means he can create a sword just by imagining it. 
He concludes that it may depend on skill level but if this works the way he thinks it does, it is pretty much a city level. He muses that it looks like the skills bestowed by the skill tickets really are special skills. From here it is just a matter of how precise he can get. He experiments with two iron ingots, one is of 2 kilograms high quality, harder than most and the other is of normal quality also 2 kilograms. He grins blithely as he finds out that it is just as the skill says if he can master this then he can really make anything he really wants. He stretched his arms exclaiming that he should start by making something small. Several hours later, his gaze falls upon a knife. He decides that if he can just stop with the parts embedded in the handle. He thinks he actually has the skill for this and wonders if he can just make it for himself. He curses himself for not being able to resist himself and puts a slab in the burner to heat it. He convinces himself to try it out this one theme. He pulls it out when it is warm enough to shape it and hits it with a hammer. Several people from the street stop to watch him work on his sword. Now he just has to darken the room to quench it. By cooling it rapidly with water. He can greatly increase its hardness and strength. This is the product of his experience making farm tools during his school's practical lessons. He does not notice Lancelot gazing at his work in awe as he pulls out the ready blade. He jumps when Lancelot exclaims that just like he thought Masaru could really make weapons. He is as startled and questions Lancelot how long he has been standing there. Lancelot simply answers with his hands on his hip that he has been there since the afternoon. He informs Masaru that they have finished sorting out the storage in the back so he thinks he would sharpen his sword while he is here. More importantly, he asks that it is a blade Masaru is forging. Masaru affirms him and says that he thinks he should still be able to make a better blade than this. Overly hyped Lancelot shows off his sword and suggests ginning his sword a few strikes. He adds that lately, it could not cut like it used to no matter how many themes he sharpens it. Masaru notices that it just looks like a piece of metal that was just beaten into the shape of a sword. He puts a hand on his chin stating that he thinks he should be able to do something about this sword and asks if he can have it for a while. Lancelot excitedly gives it to him saying that he expecting great things. He continues that there is one thing he is curious about as he eyes the iron ingot on the table, and he probes what are those. Masaru does not answer instead he smirks saying that he does have a point and he will be revealing it tomorrow so do come to check it out. He adds that he has got a little something he wants to discuss with Lancelot. Lancelot easily agrees saying that he is a little curious about all this. Masaru thanks him and exclaims that he is going to get started on the next part now. He pulls his sleeves up with his tongue stuck out and tells Lancelot that he can just do whatever. Lancelot gazes at Masaru as he walks out of the door admirably thinking that he can't tell if he is unfazable or just strong-willed. But he notices that Masaru's eyes look just like his when he picks up his sword. Masaru turns to him and asks if he said something. Lancelot turns just as quickly stating that he told him not over to do it and called him a kid. Then he darts out of the door. It is midnight when Masaru is done. He huffs that his work is finally complete. He looks at his completed pieces of work and wonders if had made too many. While he does enjoy making people happy and being useful to people, at first he just really likes making things. Tomorrow he will have to bring these into town and teach everyone how to use them. He will need to continue his sanitation lectures while he is at it for now, he wants to continue creating just a while longer, for the night has yet to end for this metal smith. A voice shakes him awake as he slowly wakes up from his nap on the desk he was working on late at night. He wakes up to a woman standing at his side to shake him awake. He asks her who is she even before raising his head from his desk. He asks if she is a messenger. She tells him that he is correct and aside from that she confirms his identity of being Masaru and says that the message is for him. She continues that afternoon three days from now, his duel with Lancelot will take place at the training area. Naran Masarudono is to report to the training area that morning, attendance is compulsory. She finishes by stating that that was the end of the message. Nasaru ruffles his head in worry grumbling that he almost forgot about it. The messenger casually starts saying that he is a weird one. He would have to meet the old geezer before she corrects herself saying what she meant was Lancelot and wants to duel with him. Masaru exclaims that Lancelot is a battle maniac and he would not listen to her at all. He pretty much decided it by himself. The woman exclaims that it means that Masaru managed to catch his interest. She looks around him checking him out but still looking unimpressed. Masaru glares at her as she unconcernedly says that it is pitiful to be him then. There will be a medical team on standby on the day itself. She tells him to just be careful not to go overboard. He yawns as he gets up and states that it will be fine and he will do his best not to hurt him badly. She puts her hands on her hips and teasingly asks what is that supposed to mean. She probes if he thinks that he does not think that he will lose to him. He sweat drops muttering that it is kinda scary that she is saying the exact same things he did. 
he dismisses it and asks if she can call him to the town plaza later. She agrees and asks if there is something he wants with Lancelot. He smirks viciously and says that he is going to do a little demonstration. Since the town plaza Lancelot mutters that he is here but wonders where Masaru is. The guards answer him that Masaru is in the well over there installing some contraptions. A guard holding a rope down to the well as a voice comes out from its depth stating that the guard can start pulling him up. He gazes at Lancelot and exclaims that it is the perfect theming. Lancelot points at him and asks if those are the machine parts he saw last night. Masaru says that he is correct and informs him that this is used to pump water, so he suggests starting right away. He exclaims for everyone to gather around and bear witness, he will be demonstrating a new tool that will help with the drawing of water. He claims that it is extremely easy to use and requests for everyone to pay attention. People slowly start to gather around him. He points at a lady standing nearby and calls her over as he asks if she would mind helping him with his demonstration. She comes closer and asks if there is something she can do. He reassures her that it does not matter if she is a man or a woman. Even a child can do this. He instructs her to first pour water into the hole of the pump here, then move this lever up and down repeatedly. He then explains that this initial water is the priming water. By pouring in the water and filling in the pipe, one can get rid of the air and create a vacuum in the pipe. By doing so it becomes possible to pull up the water from the bottom of the pipe. And with that, the water starts spilling from the opening of the pipe and into the bucket. The people start to exclaim that this is amazing and wonder what magic is this. Masaru says that this tool is called a pump and he will be installing these at all the important wells in this city. So he requests the people to make use of them. He thinks that this went well and the next up is improving the horse carriages. He grumbles that he knows because he has ridden on one of them before but these really are primitive carriage designs and below they have metal excels going across the underside and the carriage is just mounted directly on top of them. He ducks under the carriage and then gets up. Lancelot asks him what he is doing. Masaru explains that he wants to separate the part where the people serve from the parts where the wheels are connected. He will attach a frame to the wheels and have the passenger Porthian suspended and holding them will be springs at the front and the back. Lancelot looks at him confused by his explanation. Masaru smiles as he says that he only knows a little about the principles and how it is built. He has yet to actually test if his mechanism to mitigate the shaking will work. So he announces that today they will be building the foundation. He draws the outline of its foundations to make it easier for Lancelot to explain. Who looks like he did not get a thing. After working for a while Masaru managed to make a prototype. He announces that it is completed. He asks Lancelot about getting on and having a nice and slow ride. He is wheezing and gasping as he is out of magic. Lancelot does not see a reason to refuse him and orders someone to get some horses here. He goes for a small ride and when he gets back Masaru immediately asks about his experience. Lancelot exclaims that it really does not shake and comments that it makes all the carriages he has ridden until now feel like a lie. Lancelot rephrases that it is not that it does not shake but it just feels comfortable riding this. So he asks if this is because of the mechanism Masaru was talking about. Ridge and axle suspension. Masaru comments that the carriages in this city have no suspensions at all. So all he did was add parts that could absorb the impact. Models where the left and right wheels are connected together and connected to the main body via spring or other forms of suspension. Independent suspension is the model where the left and right wheels can move independently. If Masaru remembers correctly, there are many different models, so he would like to try all sorts of shock absorbers. Lancelot questions if it is possible to make the passenger area bigger. Masaru affirms him and says that he just wanted to focus on the suspension area for today, they will get to the passenger Porthian. Masaru said that he would like to make a carriage big enough to carry 9 or 10 people. Lancelot says that it is fantastic claiming that expedition campaigns will surely be more enjoyable now. Masaru continues that by incrementally improving and building on current technology, it will surely lead to larger breakthroughs in the future. As soon as he stops Lancelot's other soldiers call out to him exclaiming that they want to ride next. Lancelot barks at them to settle down stating that he will let them ride next theme. Gets out to see Masaru gesturing at something. He walks out with Masaru into an ally. He says that these things sure are convenient, and he continues that just with the things he has shown them today their lives will improve noticeably. Masaru tells him that he has made two or three other tools too. G needs to teach the craftsmen or how they work too so they can make repairs when needed. Lancelot interrupts him by mentioning the thing he wanted to discuss with him that he mentions yesterday. Masaru comments that the commander cats this on quickly, so he pulls out that topic of discussion that commander Lancelot mentions at the meeting. 
that he values the importance of having balanced deals. Lancelot states that he is correct and he believes that in this case, what their shade offers is yet to be sufficient. And so he asks Masaru what he desires. Masaru declares that he wants an agreement to halt all invasions of beast folk and humans, and possession of all their excess inventory of ore. They stand in silence for a while before Commander Lancelot asks him if that is all. Masaru affirms and Commander Lancelot states that it is decided then. A treaty in technology is a deal which most parties have much to benefit from. Masaru thanks his gods muttering that with this beat folks will be able to live in peace after their release. But he still says that about the ore even if it is just a leftover, is it fine for him just to have it? Carefreely Commander Lancelot answers that as long as that does not impede the lives of the people living here. However suddenly serious he states that he can swear on his life that there will be no more invasions from this city but he does not have the power to oppose the country. So he tells Masaru to be careful. Masaru calls out to Commander Lancelot making him turn to see his face. Masaru thanked him with a grateful smile on his face. Commander Lancelot suddenly starts laughing telling him to give his best at the duel in three days he is expecting a good fight from him. Masaru exclaims in shock muttering what did he expect from this battle maniac. But he really is grateful. With this invasion from humans should be mostly stopped. It is only verbal agreement but Commander Lancelot is an honest man. He would not break promises. He shivers in glee muttering that this was tiring and he thinks that he is done for today. He is pretty much out of magic, so he better get straight to bed. The attendant yells at him, he scurries towards Masaru, informing him that they have already gathered up everyone for the hygiene lecture so he better hurry up. Masaru pauses because he almost forgot about it. War soldiers come running to him and inquire about the shovel and pulley. He finally rests on the bed, gasping about how there he is and that teaching and explaining technology to people with no prior knowledge is really tiring. Biff on mind and body, he tears up at the thought that when he was in the home center, various craftsmen taught him the ins and outs until he got his license. Thanks to that he is somehow still alive. He thinks he understands the pain they went through, and he thanks his Oya Sans. He hopes everyone is doing alright besides those people who are no longer under the same moon or sky as he is anymore. He opens the window to gaze outside. Even but now I am of a single desire possessed to impart the a message reft of proxy that vertiz are severed he continues to mutter or something like that. He rhetorically asks himself that was cringe, wasn't it? He gazes outside to find goddess Victinia standing there with a grim expression on her face. She slowly asks if just now was that a song from his hometown. She says that when permanently separated, the speaker gives up on them ever meeting again. And at the very least, they want to be able to tell that to their partner in person. She questions if that's what it's about. He affirms her saying that it's a poem from the Haya Kunin issue. He says that even though he can't remember any of the other poems, he just said it out to himself on a whim. She asks that like the speaker in the poem, he was thinking of the person you liked. He scratches his cheek embarrassed to admit that he was. He does not notice her gaze turning sad as she asks what kind of person were they. He jumped off to the roof where the goddess herself sat and started speaking again. He says that she was cute and had a small frame the first time he saw her was when she was working, putting everything she had into her work. He thinks it was love at first sight, a late first love for him. A few months from then he decided to confess to her. He was bad at that sort of thing so he stumbled over his words and probably didn't express them very well but even so, he made sure to get his feelings across. But a few years later, she joined someone else's family and it did still hurt a little even today. But even though it took him a while he did eventually tell her congratulations on your marriage. And this might just be a coincidence but, there is a kid in the rabbit village with the same name as her. They, was her name it really took Samaru by surprise when he heard it. Just a thing he happened to somehow recall. He ended up talking about all of it though. Goddess Victinia slowly apologizes and he just smiles thinking that is what she meant the last time they parted. After all the lives she has played around with, it's a little late for that now. But nonetheless, he tells her not to worry about it. He sits behind her so their backs are leaning against each other. He continues that he has met the rabbit people and he has something that motivates him and lets him do his best he would even say he was saved by these feelings. This is why he tells her that he wishes to thank her. She smiles at him before saying in all her ignorance that of course, it was her, a goddess, that brought him here after all anyone would be cheered up just by that alone. He grumbles looking at her that this woman, she took no theme in getting carried away. He stands before him and smiles making him pause. She asks what is the matter when he does not say anything more. He turns away scratches his cheek and mutters that even though she is always such a useless goddess, she is still technically a goddess, which is what he was thinking. He has said it before but he still says that he is grateful to her and thanks her for bringing him to this world. 
He is embarrassed as he apologizes, but the goddess simply smiles and tells him that it is all good. He says that he will be heading to the smithing workshop now. He feels more energetic now, so might as well get some work done. The goddess tells him that she will stay here a little while longer enjoying the night breeze. In the three days after the incident with Victinia's he didn't have a moment to rest he ran all over town passing on his knowledge whenever he had free time. He used that to prepare for the upcoming battle. And just like that, he looks around as people line up to enter the battle arena with a wide gaze. He aggressively questions Lancelot about what all of this is about as soon as he enters the arena waiting room. Lancelot continues to stretch and states that he is impressed that Masaru did not run away. He grumbles that he does not need to hear that from him. He yells at him that he didn't hear anything about our duel becoming such a spectacle. It's practically a festival out there. Lancelot tells him that he will have to forgive his subordinates. That is just how they get when he draws his sword. More importantly, he continues that there is something else he wants to ask him. He gets frantic with sparkles in his eyes as he exclaims that Masaru said that he would improve it for him. He questions where is his sword. Masaru snarkily tells him to not be dumb he smiles and tells him what fool would hand their opponent their weapon before a duel. He tells Lancelot that he will give it to him afterward. Lancelot yells in shock but Masaru continues unbothered and apologizes informing him that he broke the word Lancelot gave him for reference. Lancelot clicks his tongue and tells him that it is fine as he pulls out another giant sword. He says that he will hold on to this resentment of mine and go all out during today's duel. Masaru gazes at his sword musing that it is a black great sword. It seems to be made from a tougher material than the sword he gave Masaru. But the workmanship is about the same. Lancelot asks Masaru if it is the sword he is taking from his shoulders the one he will be using. He questions if it is not just a short sword. Masaru peels out his sword with a smile. Lancelot grins and confidently tells him that it will make short swords all the more adorable to him when he is having his victory sake tonight. Masaru grins just as widely and says that it would be pretty if he got injured after he lost the fight. He tauntingly says that he will do his best to hold back. Lancelot comments that he doesn't hold back with your words. Lancelot says that it has been a long time since he has had an opponent like that. The last time someone said that to him, he was still a new recruit and of course, he made everyone who underestimated him eat those words afterward. Masaru probes what experience he has with losing. Lancelot confidently states none is against humans. Masaru grumbles and says that all his preparations might turn out to be for nothing. Hearing this Lancelot asks if he has some sort of strategy he comments that he is looking forward to it. He encourages Masaru that even though he doesn't seem to think much of it, there aren't many people who can take down a goblin rider alone. He tells him to just come with all his might. Masaru says that he knows and informs him that this is also part of his thanks. They enter the arena and Masaru is amazed by the number of people that have come to watch their duel. Someone, even in the crowd catches his attention he guesses that this is the messenger. She throws him a peace sign when he notices her. He notices that she has got quite a good seat and wonders who is she. The mediator announces that starting now the duel between Coastal Knight Commander Lancelot and Adventurer Masaru will be taking place. Adventurer Masaru will be taking place. The duel ends when either party is unable to continue fighting or surrenders he wishes then to strive for a fair and honorable duel with no untoward incidents. With that, he yells for them to begin. They clash fiercely. The attendant standing in the audience beside the messenger questions what she thinks about this duel as he addresses her as Ajusama. She turns to him and scolds him saying that she has told her countless times not to call her that. She turns to the battle and says that when she takes a close look at him, Masaru does not look like a fighter, but he did talk as if he had a winning strategy. She leans on her hand and continues that, the deciding factor will be whether Lancelot can understand that about Masaru. This might turn out to be a short battle. At first glance they seem closely matched, that is what she thought, but she is surprised. Masaru and Lancelot clash again as Lancelot speaks up to think that there is someone out there who can rival him in a battle of strength. Masaru counters that in that case, how about calling it his win and ending it here? Lancelot scoffs at him and challenges him to show him what he is made of. Lancelot strikes again and Masaru is barely able to dodge. He gets out of the way in an inch of time as the attack destroys the very ground he has been standing on. Lancelot tells him that he is a strange one as he approaches him again. He says that Masaru has strength and it is obvious from his stance that he also has experience with the sword but he states that his technique is terrible as he strikes Masaru again. He says that at least Masaru has good senses as he throws Masaru back with another strike. 
He strikes again and Masaru barely dodges. He curses as he realizes that it comes down to battle experience. He still can't can't move the way he wants to. He remembers Victinia's Sama said before that he could fight a war by himself but that does not seem possible with the way he is right now. But he already knows that and he managed to confirm what he needs in his strategy. He decides to try it out, his ultimate move. The years of experience, working in a countryside home center the countless hours he spent studying so that he could do anything and the efforts of all the craftsmen who taught him how to create. He puts his hand in front of him determined to put all that knowledge to use. He mutters the skill item box. Several of the logs fell out of thin air as Lancelot scrutinized what he was doing. He realizes that Masaru is a skill user. He muses that he never saw anything about this in Masaru's status report. He questions what Masaru is up to. He wonders if he is thinking of using these as he puts his foot on one of the logs with his sword over his shoulders. He inquired if Masaru would try and trip him up. Masaru deliberates that Lancelot fell for chain skill use. He uses again skill chain use woodworking, smithing, construction. Suddenly the logs were set in a way that could crush Lancelot in any second. The arena yells that these are siege weapons. Masaru smirks as he muses that the advantage of using production skills is that the finished product will take form that you envision thus. It is possible to create battering rams with the hammer part already up. Because of his current magic and skill level, the things he can create in an instant are limited to simple things like these. And if he uses a multidirectional attack like this, Lancelot's grip on his sword tightens as he realizes that this is his hidden strategy. He slices his sword in a millisecond all the logs are cut in half, and the weapon falls to the ground. The mysterious messenger looks at the scene. Lancelot yells at Masaru if he is underestimating him and shouts that he is disappointed. He notices that Masaru is keeping his distance, and wonders if he is going to use his skill again to scatter materials around. If so, he then decides to close the distance when he's using the skill and end this. His thoughts are interrupted by the view he sees. The messenger stands up from her seat in worry. She shouts Lancelot's name. Masaru stands there with a giant bow and arrow. From this position even if he moves one step he will get attacked. In that case, he decides to face it and he cuts it in half as Masaru launches it at him. But after finishing his blow Masaru is suddenly standing close to him ready to land the finishing strike. Lancelot realizes that after stepping in with his whole body, the only thing he can defend with is his arm. No, thinking of it in another way. Just his arm is enough. If he can bring this back to a close-ranged fight like the start of the duel, his train of thought is again interrupted as Marusu strikes him head-on without hesitation and breaks his sword in half. Lancelot lands on the ground and Masaru is declared as the winner. Lancelot mutters that this is what Masaru was aiming for all along. He says that Masaru was confident that his sword was going to break. Masaru does not answer but stands there looking smug at his accomplishment. But he affirms him and says that at first, he thought it'd work since his blade looked like it would break. But he had some sort of guarantee at least. He scratches the back of his head as he reminds Lancelot that he lent Masaru his sword. He confesses that he actually cut it on purpose as a test beforehand. Lancelot pauses as Masaru slightly apologizes. However, he continues that the sword he lent Masaru was made of a different material from the one he is using now, so that was still a gamble on his part. Afterward, it was just a matter of coming up with a strategy that would allow him to slice Lancelot's blade directly. Explains that is what the battering rams and giant bow were for. He tells Lancelot that the giant bow is a siege weapon known as a ballista, though he never expected that he would cut the arrow without running away. Even so, it was enough to stop his movement and that opening was all Masaru needed to get into the position to cut his blade. Lancelot gazes at his broken sword and mutters as he saw exactly earlier. He says that is true and it is one way to fight a battle, fighting not with his skill at the sword, but with the quality of his weapon well. Masaru concludes that the only thing that battle showed is that he can make weapons. He continues that this is why he couldn't give this to him before the duel. He pulls out another giant sword much like the one Lancelot earlier used. Masaru urges him to take it. He states that for making a deal with a person like him who came out of nowhere, the duel just now, and this sword is tokens of his appreciation. He states that with this, he does not think there is anyone out there who will be able to defeat Lancelot. Lancelot does a test strike that leaves almost smokes behind before he lets out a laugh. He says that Masaru might be right, giving this to him before the duel would have definitely been a bad idea. Then he goes silent and calls out to Masaru confessing that he might have said this before but Berserker one who loves to fight that is the kind of warrior he is. He continues that he loves fighting be it with swords or otherwise. The joy of gaining experience and growth from fighting. Those were the feelings that he brought with him to the battlefield. 
comrades who felt the same way would gather naturally around him, and knowing that he was able to keep on swinging his sword. But one day he looked back and there was nobody there. There was no longer anyone who could come close to him. He says that it is a funny story even though a war can't be fought by one person. The stronger he grew, the fewer battles there were for him to fight. Sooner or later, he found himself just polishing his sword every day. Before he knew it he was practically carrying the organization by himself. He supposes that this is the result of invading others who can't even put up a fight. Samurai looked at him sadly as whispered his name. Lancelot looks at the sky and claims that is why today was interesting. For the first time in a long while he had fun. So he tells Masaru to not say things like, with this sword, no one left who can beat him. Lancelot tells him that to fight is to grow, and he will grow too, as time passes. He tells Masaru that next time, he had better be stronger than the current Lancelot. He proposes to fight again sometime. Masaru scratches his cheek in embarrassment saying that honestly, he would rather pass but states that if it means he gets to see Lancelot go all out, then maybe someday. The mediator announces that in the name of Powderham Commander Lancelot, he once again recognizes Masaru as the winner of this duel, and he will now fulfill the promise that he made to him. He declares that immediately after this, all enslaved beast folk are to be released, and they will be granted freedom. The messenger smiles in delight at the news. That night at the tavern in the City of Knights, a drunk man slurs that he was really surprised to think that one could use production-type skills like that to survive in battle. He asks what the cook thinks as his little brother works in construction, and he suggests training him to do that. Cook just laughs and says that it is rare for him to make a joke like that. He addresses him as Eldam. He says that one can only pull that off if they have as many skills as Masaru. Lancelot stands behind them muttering that Masaru has that many skills. Still, drunk Cook starts to what he is talking about. Mistaking him for Eldam he continues that he saw it too, the number of skills he has. Before stopping himself as his gaze falls upon Commander Lancelot. They both freak out and start making excuses before Lancelot tells them to calm down. He tells them not to worry as he is not going to eat them or anything. He states that he was just looking for them to talk about this, actually. The two of them who brought Masaru to this city. They both pause at this as their commander continues that there was a great difference between the skills held by the Masaru and the report he received and the Masaru that he fought in the duel. He orders them to tell me everything they know and are hiding about Masaru. After a while, he has the paper in his hands as he says that his level is the same as reported but he has around 20 skills and is also a title holder he believes that it is an unbelievably large deviation from the norm. Cook states that first of all, his level he could believe it if his level was around 60 to 70 but Commander Lancelot interrupts him by stating that Masaru is only level 16, far lower than Lancelot's current level of 62. He says that except the reason they covered this up, anyone would panic after seeing this. Cook agrees with this loudly claiming that not even the knights have someone like this but Commander Lancelot tells him to leave it. He says that in Masaru's case, it'd be more entertaining to let him go free. Eldam concludes that what Commander Lancelot means to say is that it is a pity. Commander Lancelot continues that he did manage to get him to promise a second duel but it is a pity that at least for now, their connection with him is coming to an end. He questions if any of them wants to keep an eye on him. Another voice comes up behind him and says that with the excuse of wanting to cooperate with him. The messenger stands behind them and Commander Lancelot again addresses her as Ojo-sama. She smiles and says for that matter isn't there someone who had the role of a messenger pushed onto her and just happens to be free right now. A few days later at the assembly hall front entrance, he walks in front of it before pausing and gazing at it muttering that he knows he said as much at the duel but questions if the beast folk really been released and if it is fine for him to leave now. Commander Lancelot repeats that he said it is fine now. And besides, the improvements Masaru made are already starting to show results. As for the beast folk, Commander Lancelot says that they are still gathering them all. He will contact you at that village about it again. Masaru says that he got it but he wants to know one more thing. He asks Commander Lancelot what is with the bruises. Commander Lancelot's face was covered with bruises and a black eye. He questions if he got into a fight. Now that he thinks about it, there's someone out there who can give Lancelot bruises like that in a fight. Commander Lancelot turns his head and states to just say that it was someone whom he can't raise his hands against. Not like he is admitting they're strong or anything. Masaru freaks out at this. Commander Lancelot continues that firstly, if he raised my hand against a wild horse like that, suddenly there is a force that collides with his back effectively shutting him down. 
The messenger walks out saying that isn't that a terrible thing to say about a woman of marriageable age, addressing him as Lancelot Oji-sama. Vasaru realizes who she is as Commander Lancelot introduces that this rascal is his niece, Adelina 19 years old, and one heck of a tomboy. Adelina thanked him for the introduction as she said that her name is Adelina as she would be in his care from today onwards. She says that she will do her best to be of use and fulfill the role given to her. Masaru's head spins when he hears that she will stay in his care. He says that this is the first time he has heard of this. He calls Commander Lancelot Ojisama and asks if he cares to explain. Commander Lancelot looks away, and Adelina looks ready to jump on her prey. Commander Lancelot starts to tell Masaru the truth Adelina's been saying that she wants to expand her horizons for some time now and asks Meru if he knows how it is. A lady going on a journey alone is just asking for danger. Adelina scoffs at this, so Masaru concludes that he is pushing her onto him. He thinks now that beast folk have been freed he is going to need all the help he can get with expanding the village. He tries to protest that just bringing a city-raised girl to a rural village, however, Adelins cuts him off telling him not to worry as she can sleep anywhere. And more importantly, she steps closer to Masaru stating that he seems like an interesting person. Masaru bursts out laughing exclaiming that she really has Lancelot's blood in her and she will probably come with him no matter what he says. He says that if she is tagging along to come help then he has no complaint. From time to time, he warns her that she might not come back for a few years so she had better be prepared. Commander Lancelot tells him to hold it right there with a devastated face he asks what he means by a few years. Masaru simply explains that he is planning on developing the village into a city so that the beast folk can live safely. He comments that a few years is reasonable. He says that she can probably visit home from time to time. Commander Lancelot tries to say something to Adelina but she tells him to not try and stop her. She says that if he tells her not to go she will cut ties with him. Commander Lancelot says that it can't be helped then and states that he will be counting on Masaru and he better not lay a single finger on her, before he stops himself and instead says that it might not be such a bad thing before it's too late for her. Adlins and Masaru both pause at that. Masaru says if that's all and thanks them for their hospitality. He playfully says that he will come back if their lives get too peaceful or they run into trouble. Commander Lancelot wishes for fortune to be with them till they meet again. Masaru waves them goodbye. It took a little longer than he expected but he has managed to solve the rabbit folk's problem and gather a lot of materials along the way. On top of that, he managed to make some strong allies. They reach the entrance of the village as the beast's folks already gathering at the sound of newcomers. They wonder if could it be. They cheer as Masaru announces that he is back with Adelina in his tow. But the rabbit people aim their weapons at Adelina and he quickly explained the situation to the rabbit folk. There are lots of things they still need to plan and discuss but just for today. He wants to enjoy it to the fullest. May jumps in his arms with tears in her. If the goddesses smile as they see him pat May on the head on the screen. On his status there are a notification that the world development bonus was received and he has a new message. The village chief thought he was only going to gather resources. But to think he did this much, he says that Masaru surprised them again. Adelina casually throws that really her muscle-brained uncle could learn a thing or two from him. The village chief continues that he now understands Powdarim's intention and he suggests that if they mean to take a different stance from their country and cooperate with them instead, they will put away their resentment and welcome their help. However, the village chief says that he still has some worries, especially regarding the technology that Masaru taught them. He questions if they will not develop faster and start to wage war again. Masaru tells him not to worry about that. He tells the village chief that he already talked directly to their commander and secured a treaty of peace. That is why what they need to focus on now is getting ready to receive the beast folk that were released. He continues for that, they need to expand this village. He announces to a city of beast folk. Morning comes and Adelina is up to a head start as she hurries for him to wake up with May beside her. She tells him that he was the one who said to gather everyone because he has something to talk about. May encourages that this is right and anyway. He is supposed to be more alert in the mornings. He yawns as he says that it might be because he overworks a lot. But when he gets to rest he tends to sleep in. Adelina turns to leave with May on her side calling out that they will go there first. So she tells him to go hurry up and come too. He mutters that while he is at it, he checks to see what skills he has that would be useful. He curses at what he sees. He presses on the message and wonders who could have. It is a formal letter that says, Please to make your acquaintance. This is Victinia's younger sister, the goddess of magic Eresphira. Having received reports that there have been signs of civilizational advancement, the gods of Elstitia are in agreement that as a reward, Masaru-sama will have his skills raised. 
We sincerely hope that Masaru-sama will continue to live peacefully with our beloved children. She asks if they can speak when the opportunity arises. From Eresphira, he realizes that it is from a god. And it looks like this world doesn't just have a single goddess Eresphira, her younger sister. He thinks that it looks like a goddess with some common sense finally showed up. He muses that if he is getting a development reward, then if he keeps doing he might get contacted again. If he can get skills ups like this, then he will have no problem getting motivated. He is startled as both May and Adelina yell for him to come out. He walks to them sheepishly. He apologizes for keeping them waiting. He says that he has gathered them all here today for one reason, to talk about the future of this village. He states that many of them may have already heard about this from the chief. The beast folk that were taken as slaves by the humans have been successfully freed. But he continues that they have a big problem ahead of us. The freed beast folk number around 200. If they all come to this village, the population will triple what it is now. To accommodate them, they will need to greatly improve the food situation and our defenses. They will have to set up more defensive walls and temporary tents. And in a separate location, he proposes that they build a city. Looking at the hesitant faces of the beast folks he says that he has spoken to the chief and there's an area close by. He is interrupted by a beast person who says he said city but asks if that really is a thing that can be built. He hesitantly asks in the first place what kind of city is he planning to make. Masaru without hesitation says that of course, he will do his best to support them all, and as to what kind of city he asks isn't it obvious. He smiles calmly and says that a safe, inclusive, and smile-filled city of beast folk, of course. The people feel reassured by his words and smile back at him. They say that they understand and are willing to give it a shot. They exclaim that Masaru is a trustworthy human after all. He grew embarrassed when he heard that. He tells them one more thing, to all of those who have trusted him. He has not properly talked about himself yet. He feels like that is pretty insincere of him. That is why he would like to talk about it now. People grew silent at his words. They start saying that they don't actually know anything about him except that he came here after getting lost by the roadside. They continued that he seemed like he had his own problems, so they never actually asked him. He takes a deep breath and says that the truth is he, Naryumi Masaru, was brought here by the gods from another world. He stands in utter silence thinking that it is just as he thought no one would believe something like this. But suddenly they start throwing various questions at him. Like which god brought him here or by another world? Does he mean a different continent? And did he see the gods and what were they like? Adeline says that would explain why Masaru always felt out of place. She says that that is interesting and all but. Masaru shouts that he feels like he just got bad mouthed in a roundabout way. More importantly, he says did they just believe him like that? Even though that was all he said. The village chief calmly says that of course, they would. He said it was the gods, didn't he? Adelina says that if it's the work of this world's creators, it would explain a lot of things. Masaru realizes that this is a world where the existence of God is a matter, of course. The chief continues that it's a bit late for him to be saying he wants to earn their trust now. The chief says that someone who protects them as a comrade and lives and toils with them is pretty much family. He says that there isn't anybody here who would be suspicious of someone like that. Masaru smiles at those words, but the beast folk surround him again asking various questions like, what are the humans like where he is from and what kind of technology do they have? Another one yells at him to first tell how the gods look like. He yells fine, he gets it, he will talk more about himself at dinner tonight. As for the gods, he will make a bronze statue and show it next time. More importantly, he says that they need to get started on the village expansion plans. He requests them to follow the chief's instructions to get the temporary tent set up first. He calls the collection team and says that he needs to talk to them about the wood, and tells them to come to him later. As for them, he turns addressing the two females lurking behind him. He opens his mouth, but nothing comes out as their eyes practically sparkle with the urge to please. Adeline notices this and yells at him asking what about them. Recovering he says that of course there is something for them and it's very important. Adeline grumbles that he definitely thought of it just now. He says that the two of them will help him make slaked lime. She asks what is slaked lime. Masaru says that they will be using it when they are building their city. He lowly says that this is their secret. That is why he is entrusting it to them, his most trusted too. Adeline confidently says that it sounds interesting and asks if it is difficult. Masaru offhandedly answers that not particularly but it is tedious and tells her to come over here. He leads them to the furnace. He tells them they can make slaked lime with this furnace. He instructs them to first put seashells in the pot here, then add the wood or fuel below and light the furnace. Then he says that the next part is important. This box he has placed next to the furnace is the bellows by pushing and pulling the handle. It blows air out from that hole. 
They use this to continuously blow in fresh air while the fire is burning. May comments that it sounds troublesome and asks what comes after that. Masaru says that the air will pass through this tube and deliver it straight into the furnace. This allows us to achieve temperatures of over 1,000 degrees. May mumbled a thousand degrees as she did not understand what he said. Masaru thinks of a way to explain it and rubs his chin. Adeline wonders how hot is that supposed to be. He says that water comes to a rolling boil at around 100 degrees, and the temperature at which iron glows red and becomes malleable is around 1000 degrees. He continues to explain that iron melts at above 12 to 15 degrees, depending on the type of iron. Adeline asks how exactly does he measures all this. He praises her that this is an excellent question. He rubs the back of his head and says that he doesn't know either. He says that when it comes to knowledge, understanding and being able to explain the theory is all well and good but even more important is safety. That, and knowing the proper usage. Adeline says that she knows about safety but questions what he means by proper usage. Masaru smiles and says that when he says proper, whether she is able to replicate in real life how she imagines doing it in theory is what he means. However, he says that the proper way to use things varies greatly depending on the technology. He praises her again saying that it was clever of her to think that far. Position and circumstances, depending on how technology is used, it can bring great fortune and great misfortune. That is why he says that it is because of the fact that technology always comes with responsibility. He says that as long as they live, they need to always think about how they use it. He tells them to always think about the way they use technology, both when they succeed and when they fail. May hesitantly asks if it is okay to fail. He says that it is that way. He smiles gently as he rubs both of their heads. May laughs widely while Adeline looks embarrassed. He continues that rather than learning without ever failing, their failures let them reflect more on their proper way of doing things. Thinking back on their past self to guide themselves forward is important too and he is sure of it. He suggests starting by heating it up then. He thinks it looks like they will be fine from here. He has his own work to do too. The chief told him about a good place to begin creating the city. He will need to start leveling the area bit by bit, is what he thought at the time. He curses thinking that the skills from the slot machine are so cheat level it's scary. He looks at the flattened ground that almost looks like a marble. He grimes thinking that he has leveled up a bit and raised his skills. Since the last he was here, he thinks this is a bit. He wonders what this is as it looks as if some epic battle took place here and leveled the area. The area the chief recommended was a relatively flat area at a high elevation. It would certainly make for a good location, but the ground there was made of bedrock. He can't ask the rabbit folk for help with this. Looking at the situation, this is something that can only be done using his processing skills. He wonders if it can really be done. As he is thinking that, he decides that there is nothing he can do except just try and he can see the result for himself. Based on his estimate, he has created a square area of 100 meters per side. He rebs the sweat off of his face and continues that from his experience in Powdarum, it takes him about six hours for a full recovery of his magic. He had of course planned to gradually level and expand the area, but looking at it now, the task of clearing the necessary land can be done by him alone in a few days. He sweats as he thinks about what he should do. At this rate, he could go neat for two whole days and the project would still be on track. He puts a hand on his cheek and thinks if there is anything else that needs to be done. He gazes at the cliff and realizes something that under those cliffs to the north. He dashes to the area and scolds himself for forgetting. The thing that he has wanted and needed ever since he came to this world. That. Searching for that has been his top priority. He looks down from the cliff almost predatory, and he says there they are, Slime Chan. The village chief says that he is grateful to Masaru that he has been helping them every day and improving the village. He again a little more forcefully says that even now Masaru helping them build a city, and he has nothing but complete trust in Masaru's actions. Masaru simply makes a noise of agreement again. As Chief continues he asks what is that as he gestures at the slime in the box. Masaru cluelessly says that he can see that it is a slime. He says that he will be raising this guy in the village for a while so everyone please get along. The village chief asks if he is sane, and he exclaims that slimes are magical beasts. Masaru replies that of course, he is planning on using these guys for garbage disposal and cleaning purposes in the future. Looking at it now, it is being a good boy and not attacking anyone yet. He wants to do more research and learn more about them. The village chief tries to protest but Masaru continues that when he was in Powdarum he did a lot of reading up. There are magical beasts that are not hostile to humans and magical beasts that coexist with humans in other words. Magical beasts can be used as a resource just like wood and stone. So the chief concludes that Masaru wants to verify that for himself. 
Masaru calmly replies that this is exactly what he wants but his inner voice is screaming that he wants to make a toilet. The village chief puts a hand on his chin and mutters that he has never thought of using magical beasts as a resource. He points out that Masaru said earlier that he wanted to try something. He asks if he meant testing the slime out as a way to dispose of waste. Masaru says that he is correct, he wants to see what it is able to digest as food. He also needs to confirm what they are weak against, as a way to control them in the future. He wants to capture and raise the monitor lizards that can be found in this area too. He suggests that if they can start a farm, they can improve our food situation too. The first step to all of that is raising slimes. He questions what does the chief thinks about it. He thinks for a minute and replies that he understands and he will go ahead and inform everyone in the village. He started to experiment with the slime and wrote his research in Slime Research Diary by Masaru. The magical beast slimes is 60 centimeters in size, shaped like a manju, translucent green in color, and unable to climb to places higher than its own height. If the foothold it uses to climb up is less than two-thirds the area of the ground it is climbing from, it will just slide down like that. A somewhat dim creature, as a test, he tried giving it garbage like leaves and wood. The slime took it into its body and slowly digested and absorbed it. It does not seem to, particularly like leaves and wood but it eventually digested it all after a few days. It looks like it won't have any trouble with handling human waste, with Masaru's expectations high. A few days passed and an incident occurred. He ran towards the slim, picked it up, and exclaimed how this happened and how did he shrank so much. That is when he notices that the slime is dry when it's cracked slightly. He puts it into the water and it grows healthy again. Slimes are weak to dehydration. He experimented more later on and found that they are also weak to fire and seawater. Having found a way to keep slimes in check, recruiting volunteers to help with slime raising became much easier. With the discovery of the slime's unique traits, Masaru came up with a hypothesis. That hypothesis is that slimes could be one of the self-cleaning mechanisms of this world. This hypothesis arises from the fact that if one puts a slime in dirty water, the slime will absorb only the impurities leaving clean water. This world is still brimming with undiscovered knowledge. That is the joyful realization he has come to through his experiments. It is great that the villagers no longer have any objections to the slimes but they are getting trendy and more and more people are raising them now it was painful having to remind them that magical beasts are still dangerous. He sees May pat a slime as she asks him if she can keep slime as a pet. Masaru tears up as he refuses her saying that slimes are monsters, not pets. Suddenly Chief comes and asks if he is serious, and sighs loudly. Masaru straightens up and asks the Chief what's with that giant sigh. He exclaims that Masaru telling him this while they are already busy with their own tasks, and all this slime business. He is just amazed. That's all but he asks why is he leaving the village again just to gather resources. Adelina comes and explains that what Masaru is doing may seem strange but she is sure he has a proper reason that will eventually be clear. She suggests hearing him out first. Masaru says that he did not think they had nearly as much material as they needed with the future management of the city in mind. He would like to preserve as much area surrounding the city as possible. Masaru says that he had not thought of it at all and left it all to him. The village chief says that they will do anything they can to help. Masaru tells him that he just happens to have a request for the gathering team now. He would like them to help him gather tree seeds and saplings. Adelina questions what he is going to do with those. Masaru simply replies that he is going to plant them. It takes months and years to grow but only a moment for it to be cut down. That is why planting saplings ahead of time is a way of preparing for the future. He says that in the world he came from, this is known as tree planting. By lending a hand to the mountains and forests, they can gather the wood they need and while still maintaining a plentiful environment. This, too, is knowledge he learned from working in a home center not that he specialized in saplings and fertilizers or anything. Adelina says that he is thinking ten steps ahead as usual. The village chief asks how many saplings is he planning to plant and how many is he going to eat. Tenma says that he will leave that to everyone's judgment and experience. He tells them to try to get lots of different fruit demon-bearing varieties. He says they will grow the saplings in the village until they are around waist height, then move them to the mountains. The village chief says that he understands and questions Masaru when will he go out to start gathering. He says that he plans to head out once he is done preparing. He says that he will come back in about three days. He clears his throat and declares that he will say this first but he won't be bringing anyone with him this time. He says that he will be going alone. As he points accusingly towards Adelina who looks away with a smile and the village chief. The next day he finds both Adelina and May were waiting for him at the entrance. He scoffs at them as soon as he sees them. He asks Mayui if she already forgot what he said. 
May protests that it is only three days and she knows a lot about grasses and stuff. She thinks it is better for the Aju San who just arrived to stay here. Adelina asks what does he think she came here for. She says that this is a perfect chance for her to see new things and expand her not like they have any other plans for the next few days. Masaru wonders if this is coercion as he sees both ladies hugging each other. He wondered when did those two got so close. He says that he does not have a choice. He tells them they better follow his instructions to the letter. Day 1 of Scouting in the Afternoon they are walking through the forest. Adelina asks if they are just gathering wood this time. Masaru says they will be gathering stone as well but he did just talk to the chief about tree planting so he was thinking that they could also gather seeds and saplings of edible and medicinal plants while they are at it. Nay excitedly says that then they can grow really big trees. Masaru says that they are living in the forest now so he tells them to be careful of wild plants and animals. He says that cohabitation is our priority. Adelina says that he sometimes says some pretty complicated stuff. Masaru replies that in the world he used to live in, human civilization developed too much. As a result, a great number of species went extinct. It may well be that humans having too much power is a bad thing for the world. That is why he wants them to live in harmony with this world. All the living things in this world are God's beloved children, after all. Then he shies away scratching the back of his head. He adds that he might have been trying a bit too hard to sound cool there. That makes both Adelina and May smile. Adelina whacks Masaru in the back and says that if the guy who met the gods directly says so, then it must be true. May also says to start gathering. Adelina hopes they find some interesting things. After a while, Adelina looks at a load of logs. She thinks she did a pretty good job. She asks where is Masaru as it is almost time to start keeping the gathered materials. My answer is that he left a while ago. A safety check he said. Adelina worriedly wondered just how far he had gone. May's ears perk up as she says that she has gathered a lot of plants too. She will go call him. She concentrates and says that she swords over there. She points in a certain direction as Adelina exclaims that rabbit folk ears sure are convenient. But later she exclaims when she hears sword fighting. Both the ladies walk to the place where the noises are coming from. Adelina starts to ask if he is alright but stops when she sees Masaru slashing something he hurriedly interrupts her by telling her to catch something. She staggers but catches it anyway. The decapitated head of a giant earthworm fell on her hand. Adelina ends up screaming. She exclaims what is he making her catch and punches him square in the face. After a while, Masaru's face was covered in bruises as he apologized and said he thought it was obviously something she would dodge. Adelina still agitated warns that he will not get off so easy next time. He tells her that there was this dangerous looking magic beast. He tried to chase it away and it attacked him. Meanwhile, May is amazed when she sees the giant creature and says that this is a worm. She explains that normally it lives underground and eats insects and stuff. Masaru concludes that this is why the plants here can flourish. He continues that there were similar things in his world too. He says that these guys make the soil richer and help the plants grow abundantly. Adelina makes a disgusted face Masaru asks about the holes it dug. He does not any openings where it entered and exited the ground. Adelina states that if she remembers correctly, worms are good at using earth magic. They shift the earth as they move through so they don't leave the ground any holes. Masaru looks constipated at the thought of worms knowing how to use magic. May says that heard that material from worms can be used to make bowls. They fetch a good price and powder them too. Most high quality bows use worm material. Masaru asks how is it used. Adelina explains that worm muscle is elastic and durable. It is used to make a bow strings and leather armor among other things. Masaru comments that it is an unexpectedly useful material so there are people who will come to this area to hunt them. Adelina says that she just said that it fetches a good price. In the first place, there are not many people who can even defeat a worm. She stares at Masaru who nervously looks away before May cheerfully breaks the silence saying that it was her big brother after all. Masaru thinks it might be fine to add the hunting of magical beasts that can be turned into useful materials as an extra activity on their list. May says that if it is useful for magical beasts, she says they usually hunt the monitor lizards and guinea fowl for food. Masaru says birds sound delicious. May perks up at that and asks if she should go and find someone. She tells them to wait just a bit. The ears on her head stand as she continues that they sound really distinctive so she should be able to find them. She picks up some rustling sounds and suddenly grabs both of her ears, puts them close to her ears, and screams. Adlina and Masaru worriedly ask her what happened. She looked terrified with tears running down her eyes and her small frame was trembling. Masaru realizes that the way May is reacting is just like the first time they met with that stray goblin. 
No, he thinks this time it is worse. He looks around ready to attack any creature that comes close but May's small hand grabs onto his armor. She tells him not to do it. She says that she knows he is strong, but even so, he will die. She cries out that this is the one time he definitely should not fight. He crouches down to her and gently assures her promising that he will not fight. But he tells her that it is dangerous just being in the same area as that thing. He tells her to at least let him confirm what they are dealing with. She asks him if he will come back right away. He squeezes her hand, he asks which direction is it in. She points towards the forest, he gets up and runs towards it. He stops as soon as he sees what he is up against a giant four-armed demon bear hunting another giant monster. The creature was eating his prey as it crushed the trees around him with his giant size alone. Thankfully Masaru ducks out of his field of view just in time and behind a tree trunk. He feels the creature walking away with its prey. He finally slides down and lets out a sigh of relief muttering that he is saved. That was a demon bear, but not like any he had seen before. Fussed from a glance, it seems to be around 4 meters tall and has 4 limbs. He has not seen anything like that before, not even a magical beast. He wondered if they were fighting over territory. He looks at the corpus of the killed horse which was the prey of the giant before few moments before. He thinks this horse is strange too. It has 6 legs and is abnormally large. He uses his appraisal skill on it and finds that it is a salt savanna horse. It is a mutated species that evolves when a horse accumulates an abnormal amount of magicules in its body. It has horns tougher than copper and iron, which it uses to stab other animals and prey. He wonders if the magicules are the particles that serve as the source of magical energy in this world. But the more pressing issue here is that huge demon bear-like creature that killed and was eating this weird horse. He wonders why did the demon bear suddenly leave. Then he felt water drip on his nose and noticed that it was raining. He tensely thinks they will need to stop our gathering for today. He needs to meet back up with May and Adelina and report this to the chief. In the village chief's tent, they discuss what happened to them in the forest. The village chief says that it was a demon bear. Masaru immediately concludes that this means that the giant horse was a mutated species caused by magicules. The village chief explains that back when they lived in the town by the shore, they used to appear once every few years. They could not lift a finger against them. It was all they could do to weather it. They are a terrifying magical beast, aching to a natural disaster. Masaru says that looks like it is a good thing he listened to them. May and Adelina also look happy with this. The village chief agrees saying that it looks like they were lucky this time. Masaru asks why is that? Chief answers that its hunger should be somewhat satiated now, and on top of that, the demon bear leaves when it senses rain coming. Adelina exclaims if that demon bear comes to this village. Chief calms her down before she can continue telling her that he said it before that they are lucky this time this rain is the rain that signals the coming of the rainy season. He explains that around this time of year, they often get two week long rains. In the plains, the water can go from their ankles all the way up to their knees, and the forests and fields become like a single giant lake. He says that not even the demon bear can move around freely in those conditions, and if they can sufficiently prepare during this time, there should not be a problem. Masaru concludes that the chief was so calm because he knew about this. He thinks if they have this much time, they should be able to strengthen our defenses and set up traps. Suddenly realization stuck with him. The forest and fields become like a giant lake. He stands up and tells the chief that this also means that the areas where animals live will also change. The chief asks what of it. He continues that especially the aquatic animals, they will be all over the place. He sees Masaru walking away and asks where is he going. He apologizes to everyone but says that he knows the demon bear thing is important, but he can't take it anymore. Chief asks if he is going to fight it by himself. Masaru suddenly exclaims that it is the food. All they have in this village is meat he wants to eat something else for a change. He declares that this is torture for his Japanese taste buds. He tells them to give him one day. He says that is all he needs and runs off. Adeline says it is another one of his episodes and she is used to it by now. Masaru runs to the forest where there are already ponds starting to appear. He exclaims that this is amazing, no one else in sight this world of water is all his. He stumbles in water and mud and looks at his reflection in the pond. He wonders what that was, it feels like something grabbed his foot. A crab suddenly got out of the water and attacked him. He grabs its claws before it can do any damage. He pulls out a rope from his item box and wraps the crab with it. It is a forest green gazami giant crab that can grow to over 1 meter in size. When wet, its color changes to a brilliant emerald green. He exclaims that this place is full of treasures. He says that he is going to catch everything that looks edible. 
he catches a jeweled scissor crab, which uses scissor-like claws that sparkle like jewels to capture and pull its prey and can grow up to 1.5 meters in size. Green moss crayfish that looks as if it has moss growing on it, some can grow up to 60 meters in size, but they are hard to find. After that a garland poison toad contains a poison that can kill even in tiny amounts the effects of the poison depend on the individual, so finding an antidote is difficult. He is careful of the fangs of the stealth python, the large snake that can camouflage into its surroundings in an instant. Later he grabs onto a very long eel, the average length of 5 meters and the width of 5 centimeters. He practically sparkles as he laughs with his mouth watering. He says goodbye to the unbalanced diet. He thinks everyone in the village will definitely be surprised. A certain unimpressed looking goddess asks him what is he doing out here alone mumbling to himself. He jumps at the sudden noise and screams looking at the goddess who is getting out of the portal. She says that he still gets so surprised by that as the portal closes behind her. He exclaims that there is no way he would ever get used to that. He asks why did she show up when it was pouring out here. She floats in the air as she says that it is not that bad and with her god barrier she can't even get wet. He notices that she is surrounded by a glow that keeps her from getting wet and exclaims that he wants one too. He says back to the topic at hand and asks why is she here. She glances anywhere but at him and says that there was no reason. It is not like she was wondering what he was doing out here in the rain. Like what he is planning to do with all those crabs and other things he caught nothing like that. He muses if could it be that she's never eaten since she's a goddess. He exclaims that he does feel like teasing her a bit but he says that she has a good eye. Anyone who sees all this can't help but be interested, after all. He says that he knows how she feels. He grabs her hand and pulls her along saying that since it is just the two of them, let's treat themselves a little. In a few moments, he had prepared a small hut in a restaurant style with a table and two chairs. He says that the temporary base is complete. She praises that it is pretty well made for something he just put together. He pulls out the crab and deviously says that she looked interested in it earlier so he suggests eating some crab. She tells him that they are not eating it like that. He complies saying that boiling is all they need to cook it. He says that it is not a complex dish, but it will still be great. He tells her to sit on one of the chairs and wait for it to be ready. She looks over at him as he prepares the dish for them and notices that his hair is wet from rain. She picks up the towel near her and puts it on his head. He stops as he feels something fluffy on his head and looks over to find his goddess drying his head. She scolded him to stop moving as he was making it harder. He can tell that she is drying his hair but asks if that was always her character type. She whacks him on the head calling him rude. She shyly tells him to shut up and watch the fire. She says that this is just her being selfish. It is just a way of recognizing his hard work in helping the village and the seaside town and everything. They busk in silence as their food is getting ready. Finally, their boiled crab is served. Victinius says it looks better than she thought it would. Masaru causes that because Victinius went and did something weird the atmosphere is all awkward now. She says that she can't eat it as the shell is too hard. He says there is a trick to that. He takes it from her and slides one piece from the other, and gives it to her saying that she wanted to try it. She hesitantly bites into it and exclaims that it is delicious. She blushes and says that this delicate balance of rich umami and sweetness is not bad. Masaru gazes at her as she is munching on her plate. They playfully banter as Victinius thanks him for the meal. She says that, it is the first time she has eaten a meal like that. He welcomes her and replies that it looks like there is still some leftover even though he said that. She asks if she can have some to bring back for her sister Ain. Masaru says that he remembers her, that she's the one who wrote that message he remembers, and seems to have a lot more common sense than someone he happens to know. Victinius exclaims that the last part wasn't necessary. He says that she can bring it back, but asks how will she do that. He states that it won't taste as good once it gets cold. She says it will be fine if she puts it in her item box. On a different note, she says that he really can make a lot of different things. He can make food, useful tools, and swords. She says watching him never gets boring. He grumbles that she is the one who gave him these skills. Victinius elaborates that this is not what she meant. Skills are just skills. They will not help him make anything if he doesn't have the knowledge or imagination to use them. They are the most basic of basics. Nasaru smiles as he says, of course, he knows how to make things. He used to work at a home center after all. He adds that he was actually more like a handyman since it was out in the country. The home center in the countryside is a huge building taking up a large space open from early morning to late at night. It is a retail shop where one can shop for all sorts of flowers and plants. During the planting season, they work with the local farmers and open shop earlier than usual to make it easier for them. 
he studied how to handle various flowers, trees, and vegetable seeds and saplings that they prepared and kept in stock during different times of the year. He learned to build and dismantle coops and sheds and lay bricks and pavements, from woodworking to electronics, pet food, stationery, bedding, and even diapers. He says that it is because he had to work with so many products that he has so much information up here. He points towards his head, not to mention that it is useless unless he is able to explain to others so they know how to use it. And as soon as he learns something, they don't have enough staff to help. He grows frantic and he grumbles at that lazy manager who never does anything about it. And then they ask him to learn another new product. That manager has no idea what the situation is like. He is panting by the end as Victinia's comments that he had it rough. Victinia's positively says that it worked out and she is sure the people there are doing well because of his help now. And she heard about her statue too. She exclaims that he made a bronze statue of her. As a god, she couldn't be more proud. But even so, he changed the subject saying that they need to do something about that demon bear. Or it wouldn't be a very nice welcome to the beast folk who just moved into the new city. They sit in silence after that but Masaru continues that he knows he came out here on a hunting spree but in the end, he is just running away from thinking about the demon bear. Victinius gets up and exclaims that she won't acknowledge something like that. After all, he has come all this way in this new world by doing lots of amazing things. She can't stand the thought of Masaru being weak. He hears her muttering something about her statue he looks at her before smiling and then laughing. He states bringing that up is not fair, so he asks what is she going to do if he actually does end up running. She says that it is obvious that she will never forgive him. He mocks asking if she is a kid. He teases that Victinia's really is a useless goddess. They say that if a goddess says so, he supposes he can't sit around being lame forever. The morning was full of construction noises. The villagers in Masaru were working hard on completing the walls. A villager comes running to find Masaru. He informs Masaru that they are almost done with the wall near the entrance. Masaru gazes at the wall in awe as he comments that it is looking good. It looks like they have built the lookout post too. The villager says that now they won't have to worry about attacks from small fry anymore. He says that they are also thinking of adding platforms alongside the lookout post, where archers will be able to fire from. Masaru tells him to carry on what they are doing here and asks how are the other areas coming along. He informs Masaru that the traps outside the town are coming along smoothly. He asks Masaru if they could trouble him to give them more stone materials. Masaru agrees and says that he has a lot to spare after clearing the land for the city he is going to develop. Filling the lull that the rainy season brought, their demon bear countermeasures progressed smoothly. And to be honest, he did want some time to level up by himself but, since he is strengthening the village's defensive capabilities he is fine with this too. That night at the gathering area of the rabbit folk village, he is eating dinner as he muses that it looks like he got a new skill when he wasn't looking. It is not battle related though. He mutters that he will need firepower. They heard him and questioned if he meant fire magic. He tells her that it is a little different from fire magic. He asks if could it be that one of the rabbit folk here. She replies that she doesn't think they do but says that the fox people may have someone like that. He says that maybe he will ask Lancelot to send the fox people over first. He wonders if they can do something like fox fire. Adelans joins them sitting opposite to Masaru. She says that she doesn't think there are any beast folk who can use magic are there. She states that from what she has heard, beast folk have amazing physical capabilities, but not much in the way of magical ability. Come to think of it, he has not seen any of the rabbit folk use. Actually, he hasn't seen any magic at all since coming to this world. He pauses and asks Adelina in the city they were any questions around how many magic users were there. She answered that there were about two people there who could produce water. He grumbles about that useless goddess how dare she. He questions what happened to Alstisha. A dazzling world of swords and magic may notices something wrong and asks Masaru what is wrong. He smiles calming himself he says that it is nothing and he was just thinking about what he will do when he meets that goddess again. Suddenly there is a ping sound and he realizes that he got a message. A screen opens in front of him there is a message from the goddess. It says that she will tell him about the states of magic used in this world. May asks what is that? She has never seen it before. Adelina adds that there seem to be words written on it. He blurts that he told them before about that goddess. He suddenly closes up on them startling both the ladies he says that this is something that appears when he receives a divine message. Both accept his answer without a hitch. He presses and the contents are about the current state of science and magic in this world right now. This world is slowly building up its foundational knowledge and principles. Although there are magical beasts who use magic as their specialization. The sapient races, including humans, elves drafts, and beast folk. 
and demons have stopped at the observational stage without conducting further research into magic. Therefore, they would like him to be the one to show them the path of magic. They look forward to his activities in advancing the civilization of this world. He concludes that she is asking him to advance magic. Adelina asks if he can use magic. Masaru supposes that he can use healing magic. May practically sparkles as she looks at him on the other hand Adelina seems to envy him. He tells them to stop looking at him like that. He says that rather than talking about technology, the message talks about the knowledge that will be the foundation for magic. Maybe they want him to get the people of this world to study. May asks if he knows the magic principles. He answers that he does not know about them but if it is teaching magic, he can at least build some facilities to help magic lies be more widespread. In other words, he declares that he will need to build a school. May questions if that is something from his world. He answers that it is a place for one to gain knowledge. Starting from six years old almost everyone spends nine years there learning all sorts of things. Even more for some people who want to further their studies. Adelina is amazed and comments that this is how technology spread in his world then. He says that this world has its own technology too. She asks how much of a difference between their worlds is there. He says that it is hard to explain with words then exclaims that he has something perfect for that. He pulls out a smartphone and places it on the table. May questions if it is a box. Masaru gives off a small laugh and says that this is a device that represents the technology of his world. Adelina looks at it confused. Masaru tries to turn it on but exclaims that he forgot to charge it. He wonders if he can still turn it on. He questions if it is because he put it in his item box. He knew that food and living things don't rot when in there but could it be that time is stopped entirely inside? He exclaims that this is an amazing item that lets one talk to someone who's far away but he says that it can do other things too like take pictures and videos, play tens of thousands of songs. He continues that they can access the internet and play games. Adelina looks intrigued. Masaru says that they probably didn't understand most of that so he will just show them what it can do right now. He clicks their pictures, plates some songs, and shows them games in a calculator. Later on, he exclaims that he got too relaxed and ended up fooling around. He needs to think about magic. Like May said, education itself is not the issue, but he can't teach them to do things if they don't even have prior knowledge. He wonders what is Eresphira thinking. Then suddenly stuck with the idea he gleefully spells out his goddess names and asks what can he possibly do when the only thing he can use is healing magic. His goddess comes out of the portal and states that it is simple since Masaru is one who can use magic. She pauses realizing what she just did. She exclaims that he tricked her. He made her come here to answer him. Masaru confesses that he just thought he would ask since she was probably watching him anyway. More importantly, he says that he already knew that, but he can only use healing magic. The goddess states that he is wrong. She says that he has only used magic once so far during the last part of his duel with Lancelot. She says that he probably did it unconsciously, though, at that time, he was reinforcing his sword with magic. He asks if he had not used it in the mountains against those bandits. Victinius says that he was merely using his skills at that time. The skills granted in the realm of the gods take the form of the mental image of the receiver. In Masaru's case, he seems to be strongly influenced by the home center he worked at, as well as by games. He concludes that the healing magic in this world is not the type where there is a glow as it heals. Victinius tells him that to heal, he needs medical knowledge in the first place and even after activating it, the healing still takes time. He has always thought those slot skills he received were weird since they were all oddly convenient and useful for him specifically. Masaru gets what she is saying, and asks what should he do to use magic again, as he did in that duel. Victinius says that he knows that feeling when magical energy flows in his body during skill activation. He affirms her saying that he even drained his magic completely one time. She smiles and tells him to imagine using his magic as a fuel or energy source and picture it flowing in him. She says that understanding how that flow comes about, how to strengthen it, and how to activate it is the basic principle of using magic. He shows a thumbs up and says that he will try it out. He encourages her saying that she can do it when she tries. She is annoyed and tells him that it is enough. He asks if this is really okay. She exclaims that it is fine and it is not like she is scared of being scolded by Hira or anything. He teasingly asks if does this not count as interference. Could it be that she is actually really concerned about him but she is just trying to play it off? Victinius shuts him up with a divine don't get carried away fist. She tells him not to get too full of himself. She says that she does have her reasons. She tells him to at least let him help this much. She shyly says that it is because of her younger sister Eresphira, the goddess of magic. This is the least she can do to take responsibility as the older sister. He tells her that he doesn't really have any complaints about magic. 
he says that he is just praising her for stepping up as the older sister. After seeing that unexpected side of Victinia's, he began his daily research on the magic. They also finally completed the village's demon bear countermeasures. Normality returned, and they back to enjoying their peaceful days. Because the demon bear didn't even come. Nasaru is largely disappointed. Adelina tells him that it is a good thing that the demon bear didn't come. Nasaru says that they have to take it down. He says that it could come back for them next year. May says that she understands that but now the village is safer. Chief says that even the arrows he prepared can now be used for hunting. Nasaru says that he added backward barbs to the arrows with those. The arrows become extremely hard to remove. Once they've pierced their target and he deviously adds that when he adds poison to the arrow tips, they become many times more effective. The arrows can't be pulled out while the poison circulates. Adelina comments that the weapons he makes are really merciless. Nasaru exclaims that these are necessary when he's fighting for his life. The chief comments that their hunting team has been really praising both the bows and the arrows he made. He sees people practicing with his bows. Nasaru recognizes the ones they requested he make from the treat. He asks about the worm bow he made. Everyone went rigid when they heard him. The person who was practicing earlier explains that the bowstring is a little too tough. Even their strongest guy can barely draw it, as he can see. He sees the person trembling with the bow in his unsteady hold. He says it is a shame, but none of them have been able to actually use it. Nasaru thinks it must be that their statuses are not high enough. The person holding the newly made bow curses and asks Masaru to show him how to shoot this thing one more time. Masaru takes the bow and says that the technique is exactly the same as how Masaru taught them. He stretches the bow and shoots it forward. The rabbit person says that it didn't even stop after destroying the target. It went straight through the wood. Other comments that this is amazing and all but Masaru really is a freak. Masaru exclaims that it does not sound like a compliment. He cursed in his mind as he realized that because he had been practicing magic lately, he magically reinforced his arrow without thinking. But he is sure a tree or something will stop eventually. Suddenly there is a loud thump that makes everyone tense the people keeping the watch urgently announce an emergency near the north cliff are demon bears. They are coming. They announce that it is coming from the northern cliff and tell people to evacuate now. Nasaru almost tears up as he says that it is a coincidence and asks that it is not his fault right. Both the chief and the person remain silent. Nasaru notices something and says that it sounds like it has been hurt somewhere. Chief tells him that this is what they have been preparing for anyway if it lived near the northern cliff. It would have gotten to this village sooner or later. In fact, it might be better that they are able to deal with it earlier. The chief grimly asks Masaru if he can do it. Masaru smiles confidently and tells him to contact Mei and Adelina and start the evacuation. And to get everyone who can fight to stand by at the defense wall. He orders the hunting team to come with him. He will take the lead, as they planned. He hurries to leave but is stopped when Mei and Adelina approach him. He pats their head and tells them that he is leaving the village to them. He declares that for the peace and safety of this village, this is their first demon bear hunt. The demon bear counter-attack battle begins. Adelina reassures Mei that everything will be alright when she sees him try and pick up sounds from the hunt. He says that things will go well with Masaru. She calls her again when she sees that Mei is not responding. But Mei says that it is nothing and she has faith in him. Meanwhile, in the forest, Masaru looks at the demon bear that is quickly approaching that village. He seems to be quite pissed. Looks like Masaru's prediction was right, but he didn't think that he would hit his eye. He looks above him at the edges of two cliffs the rabbit folks are fully armed and ready to attack. Their strategy is simple enough. They have to lure him to the trap zone that they specifically prepared to deal with the demon bear. The hunting squad will provide cover fire on top of the cliff with the bows that he had prepared in advance. After that, he will act as the bait and lure him into the trap zone. If we fail it will be the death of him and the destruction of the village. The rabbit folk were ready to attack. He thinks that this is a battle that they can't afford to lose. He waits till the demon bear is right in front of him. The first volley is ready. He gives the signal and several arrows pierce down towards the demon bear. Arusu stays behind to avoid the damage. He notices that its wounds are too shallow. But this will do the real show starts now, a tag game with his life on the line. The demon bear growls as Masaru yells for him to follow his trail and catch his attention. It growls and claws at Masaru coming inches close but deflates suddenly. Masaru wonders what is going on. He questions if it is because he took damage from the volley just now, but thinks that it doesn't seem like it. Then he realizes that it is the poison, the one that he got from the ground poison toads that he caught during the rainy season. He applied some toad poison on several of the arrows that he prepared for the hunting squad. 
The effectiveness of ground toad's poison varies depending on the target, due to their unique traits. To be honest, he thought it would only have little effect. But it is working, no doubt about it. He signals for Second Valley as Masaru runs for his life. Several more deathly arrows fly his way and the demon bear falls to the ground. He exclaims that he finally did he can't believe it. The demon bear is finally down for the good. He hurries to check his status. If he checks the amount of experience that he gained then. He laughs and his eyes sparkle as he looks at his status. He has really defeated the demon bear. The rabbit folks from the cliff yell that they will meet up with him there. They suggest bringing back the news of the subjugation and having a banquet to celebrate. Masaru agrees and tells them to remove the traps and quickly return. He thinks that it seems like they can live here with a peace of mind now. He suddenly feels another demon bear approaching and yells for the rabbit folk to not come down. He asks what is wrong and Masaru yells back that this is not it, this is a different demon bear. He yells that this is different from the demon bear that he saw. The rabbit folk see the demon bear is right behind Masaru they yell for him. Masaru is saved in a matter of seconds as he raises his sword and still ends up getting pushed back far enough. He realizes there was more than one there were two demon bears. Masaru runs and hides behind a tree. He gazes down and thinks that this does not look good. The chunk of the armor that was protecting his left bicep and around the chest was gone. Masaru dodges another one of his attacks. The rabbit folk attacked him but somehow he managed to catch all the arrows that were sent his way. He roars and starts to lung towards them instead. The village chief exclaims that he is heading this way. Another says to do it one more time and tells them to regroup and fire another volley. An arrow is suddenly jammed into the demon bear's arm and it roars in pain. Behind him, Masaru mocks if he is planning to escape and reminds him that he is fighting Masaru. A rabbit folk is yelling at him reminding him of the wounds he is suffering and telling him to escape or he will be killed. Masaru pays him no mind as he staggers to stand up. The demon bear growls at him. He got his attention. He can still move his body, he thinks he can do this. He still has a chance. He still has some cards up his sleeves. The traps are still in place, he decides to head over there. As long as he can get there in time, he just has to get there. He sprints to the area dodging several of its attacks. He falls to the ground when he is stuck by the demon bear. He thinks this is not good. He leans on the tree and sees the demon bear in front of him. He thinks just 100 meters more. He has been using heal the whole time, but the recovery time is too little. If only he had a minute to focus on healing. He thinks it is game over here when he sees the demon bear raising its claws at him. Even though he made friends whom he wants to help, he is finally able to have someone whom he cares about or rather whom he worries about. He whispers an apology to everyone as he closes his eyes. A stern voice asks if he is going to give up just like that and voices her boredom. He opens his eyes to see Adelina blocking the demon bear's attack as she continues that for someone who was able to win against Oji-san. He is a bit weak where she asks if this is just a nosy attempt to broaden her horizons and if that's the case she hopes he doesn't mind if she butts in. Masaru's mouth is wide open from shock as the tomboy lady joins the fray. Masaru is baffled to see Adelina. He hesitantly asks why is she here. She asks if should he not be thanking her right now instead as she went out of her way to save him. Though she tells him that she does want to take all the credit but he should give his thanks to Mei-chan. It is because of her that Adelina was able to make it in time. At the entrance gate after Masaru chased after the demon bear, Adelina asks Mei what is wrong but Mei only dismisses her answering that nothing is wrong. And she too, has faith in Masaru. Adelina crouches down to her and gently tells her to feel free to tell her what's on her mind. She supposes they have always been told what to do and be treated like kids but, that's what she believes but their relationship with Masaru is not one where he always gets to order them around by him. However, she continues that it might just be my imagination but such a misunderstanding is not necessarily a bad thing. She reminds Mei that Masaru himself also said that, there is nothing wrong with misunderstandings. Mei looks down and slowly whispers that she heard two roars. Her voice trembles as she continues that she heard another roar of a different bear, mixed with the huge roar of the big bear just now. She thought it was only her imagination but, if it was true then Masaru might be in danger. He exclaims with terror clutching her, that she gets so scared just by thinking about it. Tears drop from her eyes as she begs Adelina to save Masaru. Masaru back in the forest laughs openly saying that it seems like it won't be enough to just give his thanks to Adelina. He says that he owes Mei-chan a huge debt. Adelina suggested to start by getting out of this alive. She continues while Masaru heals himself and says that still, this is quite surprising. It was a strike to his vitals. His eyes widen as he sees the bear standing and ready for another attack. Adelina stands between him and the bear. He tells her to run exclaiming that she is going to die if she stays and helps him. 
she calmly tells him to stop joking around and asks if he really thinks that a young maiden like her would come to a place fraught with danger without any backup. She signals for the rabbit folk to attack and suddenly the bear is surrounded by the armed rabbit folks from every direction. Chief orders them not to falter, charge, and attack. Adelina explains that everyone took Mei Chan's words and decided to come to give them a hand. She comments that they make great companions. Masaru smiles gratefully. The chief yells for them not to retreat and keep moving forward. Below this cliff is a trap that was set up to kill the demon bear. At the end of the cliff, there is a giant hole with sharpened edges of sticks poking out. He claws at Adelina and her weapon is thrown back. She thinks this is not going according to plan. He claws at her again but Masaru comes in time to block it as he yells that everyone has done a good job. He turns around and tells everyone it is all going to be all right now. He thanks everyone and tells them to leave the rest to him. He thinks thanks to the time bought by everybody he was finally able to heal himself to the point he could move his body. He is not fighting alone. He is grateful that he got to know everyone after he ice skied. He takes a deep breath and launches his ultimate move. A log hits the bear right on the chin, pausing his movements as Masaru gets up to strike him. He jumps over the bear but the bear manages to strike him in mid-air. But he does not filter, he decides that with this it is checkmate. A giant gastrophete appears on the ground at the edge of the hill. It shoots making both Masaru and the bear fall off of the cliff. He thinks that the bear probably also has his own life, but they too have theirs. They have to continue moving forward. Therefore, he apologizes to the bear as he sees it fall into the trap and thus to his death. Above him, Adelina sees both Masaru and Bear fall into the trap she worriedly yells his name. After a while, he hesitantly says he can hear her. He jokes that she is acting as if he died or something. Relief flushes over her and she runs towards him and punches him in the stomach. He grunts in pain and exclaims what is she doing, claiming that he will really die. She looks away claiming that it was his fault for making her get upset over nothing. The other villagers approach him expressing their relief. They thought he perished with the bear. After he explains what happened, Adelina says that she could not believe he was able to escape from the clutches of death by summoning a log while he was falling. So a piece of log not only shielded him from the bear's attack but also saved his butt. He adds that it is supporting their life too. He comments that they are quite reliable. He continues to say something about the demon bear, but the villagers tell him that there is no problem here they inform him that he is not breathing anymore. Others exclaim that they have won, they finally won against the demon bears. He says that he can't believe there was a second one. Another one chides him telling him that this is no laughing matter. Relief washes Masaru and he finally lets his body relax. Adelina exclaims as she sees him go limp, but pouts and finds that he is just asleep and snoring loudly. The villagers say that he fell asleep. He murmurs that he got them all worked up. Adelina looks down on his sleeping face muttering that this is just like him. She remembers him fighting bravely to protect them. She thanks him for his hard work. After that, they decided to head back and return in triumph because it was a job well done. Masaru and the crew reach the entrance gate where they meet Mei and other villagers. Masaru is getting a ride on the back. In the god's space, Hira and Victinius are looking over him while sipping their tea. Hira says that he did a great job. Victinius pouts and says that this is but a natural outcome and asks if she has finally acknowledged Masaru as the goddess's chosen. Hira too asks her, wasn't she losing her mind a moment ago when he was about to be killed by the demon bear? She remembers her yelling that Masaru is going to die at this rate. Hira comments that it is unthinkable for a god to shake her off so as to go help a mortal. Moreover, she continues that before fighting the demon bear, she even went out of her way to descend to give words of encouragement. Hira wonders who's the lucky guy. She continues to stare at Victinius. Victinius folds her hands and says that this is not that big of a deal. It is not like she directly lent him a hand or anything. Besides, Masaru is her apostle. She says that there is nothing wrong with her watching over him. Hira says that it is not like it is against the codes of the gods but says that her motives are a little different now than they were in the beginning. She asks if she is finally acknowledging him. Hira thinks this just keeps things in moderation. She asks what is next now that the demon bear is defeated and peace has returned. The city development plan is finally getting on the right track. Victinius says that she is looking forward to the completion of her statue. Hira says they might as well raise their glasses in celebration of their triumph. Victinius says that it is a lovely idea. They cheer to the future development of Victinius's new world. Several days after the hunt, Masaru announces that they have finally defeated the demon bear. He suggests they make haste and proceed with the city development plan. He looks at the glum and disconcerted face of them and says that they don't seem to be up for it. A villager comes up to him and asks that they get the gist of the plan but, what about the land? 
Masaru says that they have plenty of land. The villager says that this kinda took them by surprise but asks what are these partitions and white lines. Behind him, the entire field was parted in several small blocks. They are at the Beastman City for the construction plan. Masaru says that he will start by explaining about it. First of all, he has already drawn the area for the housing. The white line will be the dividing line and the partitions will become the foundations of building houses. The villager asks if they can just build their houses anywhere they want to. He demands an explanation of why they can't do it. Masaru says that there are many reasons for it but in his world, there is something called land readjustment. The purpose is to smoothly control the flow of people and to keep the noise pollution away from the housing area. By arranging houses, workshops, and stores according to their purposes, he continues that it is also very effective in dealing with disasters such as fires or crimes. The village chief says that by segregating effectively, it will be much easier to maintain public security and suppress any trouble that might arise. Secondly, he says that since they have finally ensured the safety of slimes it is time to start building ground passageways and sewers. Consequently, without sewerage, the construction of housing in this city will not be permitted. Adelina says that this is something that they had already mentioned before, during their lecture in the coastal city. If she is not mistaken, it is a canal that transports rainwater and sewage. Masaru says that she sure did her homework. He continues that this is also for the sake of maintaining the city's hygiene. The villager asks if that means they have to pee and flush it in the house too. He says that is just like what they have always been doing. Masaru exclaims that that's a big no. He explains that if they do not handle their waste correctly, the city's hygiene will be ruined. If that happens, they will be exposed to the risks of diseases spreading, which will take away the lives of many people. He says that this is a city where they all will settle their lives in. Therefore, they ought to get rid of any hidden dangers as soon as possible. The chief comments that it is a horrifying story. Masaru says that they also share the same opinion. Last but not least he says that he has already drawn the area for the first housing site. All of the houses will be built within the white frameworks. The villagers tell him to hold on a second. They say that the size is only as big as a large tent. And they say that most of our families consist of six people. He asks why don't they build bigger houses. Masaru tells them not to worry as the houses that are built in the city will be two-story stone. He says that it will be even more comfortable. Before he can continue what he is saying the villagers explode when they hear two-story stone houses. They say that he should have said so in the beginning. They can't believe it and wonder if it is a dream. They question if they are going to be living in extravagant houses like that. They ask Adelina if there are two-story stone houses in the coastal and port towns. She answers that most of them are inns and commercial buildings. There are not any two-story stone houses owned by individuals. She explains that in the capital, houses are built according to their social status. Commoner houses are built using wood, straws, and cloth. Houses for businessmen and the rich are very big and built with bricks, whereas the nobles live in two-story stone houses. Nasaru realizes that this is why everyone is so excited. Since everyone's so fired up, he suggests that they start building some houses. Masaru with a few others has set up some pillars beforehand. He requests everyone to take a look. He shows them the foundation. One villager says that they will be building this next. He says that those partitions are the foundations for the houses. Masaru says that he will give them a briefing regarding the techniques later. He says that today, all of them will be setting up the pillars. They say that they have never seen a building technique like this. He asks if Masaru is sure it is safe. Masaru assures him saying that although it is only a wooden framework, but if the wood is cut intricately, it can fit like a puzzle and assemble. He tells them to remember the process as they follow the instructions that will be given by the folks that have helped him. The villagers say that it seems easy enough. The village chief asks if he is going to be putting stones in between the pillars. Masaru says that he is right, according to the framework, that is. However, he says that in addition, please also keep it in mind to smear this. May exclaims that this is what she made with Adelina. Masaru says that she is also correct. It is a mixture of hemp and cooked slaked lime and seaweed that he got from the beach, and this bad boy is called plaster. If they smear this over the stone walls, they will become even more durable. He adds that it is fireproof too. These materials can also be used to make concrete. It is very effective in making roads. He told them that the lake slime truly deserves to be called a secret weapon. Adelina comments that he is knowledgeable and asks if this is his main line of work. She wonders if he is a craftsman. 
He says that he used to deal with these kinds of material a lot due to his old job, and since it was in the countryside, most of the people whom he worked with were either relatives or friends. He had to deliver the materials to the craftsmen, so he managed to accumulate a lot of knowledge during his time working with them. So it is not exactly his main job or anything, be that as it may, by using skills, he is able to make up for his inability to make those materials with the required techniques. Therefore, he is able to make all kinds of things, making the wooden framework, for example. Then he puts a hand on his chin and wonders about some of the work that he used to help out with might be against the law thick. May looks up at him and asks if he is a bad person. That makes Masaru freak out he says that he does not deny it but he tells May that he might be going overboard sometimes, but at the moment as it is helpful for the folks it is fine. It is okay. Mei Chan. Adelina looks at them as she apologizes for misunderstanding him and hugs him. After that, he declares that he has already given instructions for the length and so on, so let's start. He will be preparing all the materials. Mei calls behind him and suggests building a wonderful city together. Nasaru smiles and gives her a thumbs up. They start the construction with the villagers helping them and after a month Masaru comments that things are going according to his plan. Mei comes running to him announcing that it is installed. Masaru tells her that he has finished the prototype on his end. Mei asks how would they use it. Masaru answers that as she can see, just use it like this. Mei sees him sitting on the commode as he points at it. He says that he doesn't have to put it in words, does he? He says to just push it out with all they have got. He looks at Mei who is silent for an uncomfortably long time. He asks why is she keeping her distance. She says that he is kind of disgusting. He exclaims that it hurts if she puts it like that. Anyway, he says that there are not any problems, and he suggests starting mass producing it. He says that it is completed after the installation is finished. May smiles again as she says that the city has grown quite large. Masaru says that it is all thanks to the hard work of everybody, but he says that they still have a long way to go. The housing area is mostly finished. We have to start working on the fields for food. May's face suddenly becomes solemn, but he continues that regarding industry, we also ought to make the best use of this region. She suddenly said that he does understand what she's trying to say here. He smiles and puts a hand on her head saying that he will work with everyone, and promises that he will not recklessly do everything by himself. She smiles spelling out a small okay. A villager comes running towards them. He yells that something happened, and he tells Masaru to come with him. Masaru asks him what happened and why is he so flustered. He says that there is trouble at the gates. Masaru asks if something went wrong with the transportation of materials. He exclaims that there are humans unconscious near the gates. The villagers gossip that the news about the collapse is true, and a villager asks if they are the same as Masaru. But one of them comments that they are not. He gazes inside the window where the humans are sitting. He says that he remembers seeing that armor. He says they were the humans who expelled them from the port town. The human soldiers along with Masaru, Adelina, and the village chief are sitting in the room. He continues that there is no mistaking it, they're knights of the Grotta's kingdom. The soldier says to allow him to introduce himself again. He is fried, one of the king's guard, knight of the Grotta's Chiveric order. The young man behind him is called Distar, and the person who is sleeping on the bed is Gold. He says that he can't thank them enough for their help elder of the Rabbit Man tribe. Adlina and Masaru both grow wary when they hear of Grotta's kingdom's Chiveric order. He realizes that their ranks are even higher than Lancelot and his men. The soldier says that he is truly surprised that they are able to use healing magic. He turns to Masaru and asks his name. He introduces himself plainly by his name and includes that he is an adventurer after an awkward pause. Adelina yells at him to hold his horses. She says that he was conferred an amazing title by the goddess. He yells back that he would just dig a fit for himself again like last time. The soldier asks who might this young lady be. Adelina apologizes saying that she is Adelina niece of Lancelot. He exclaims that she is the niece of Lancelot, and he says that he is honored. Tales of his courage and bravery have even reached the capital. She says that she is currently living in this city, as the coastal city is the temporary ambassador a proof of their alliance. Fried comments that it seems like she shares a good relationship with the chief here. The village chief interrupts saying that he is right and just like what happened in the port town. They have doubts that they are here to attack their city that has just managed to form friendly relations. The suddenly looks down and starts to apologize but the chief interrupts him again saying that it is fine. He says that lending a helping hand to someone who is in trouble is what the beast men do. Besides, he says that he already learned his lesson from Masaru, that they ought to not lump every human in the same group. But with that said he asks what business they have so deep in the mountains. Fried answers that it is a direct order from the king they are here to subjugate a mutated beast. 
Adelina and Masaru whisper to each other that the beast he is talking about could be the demon bear. He continues that it is a mutated horse called the One-Horned Demon. It is dark-skinned and has six legs. He wonders if he is talking about that mutated horse. He raises his hand and says that what he is about to say might be hard to take but it was already devoured by a similar mutated beast. Fried stands up exclaiming if he is talking about a demon bear. Masaru realizes that he also knows about the demon bear. The soldier exclaims that he was attacked by the demon bear in the middle of their investigation. Due to that beast, the rest of the squads were forced to retreat and had to roam about the forest for an entire week. He tells them that it is dangerous for them to stay here. He says that if so, they should come back to the kingdom with them. Masaru explains that this is another difficult topic. He says that the demon bear is already exterminated by them. The surrounding areas are no longer dangerous. Fried tells him to not even mention a platoon. He exclaims that it is a beast that can even instantly decimate the king's guard. Masaru asks if they would like to take a look at the bear's corpse, if so then he requests them to also take a look at the horse's corpse too. Fried freaks out asking if he has it with him, and asks if he really has the corpse of the horse with him. He suddenly calls regaining his calm demeanor. Masaru muses that he received orders from the king to exterminate the mutated beast. From his reaction just now the corpse of the horse seems to be of great value to him. At the very least he knows that they definitely have an ulterior motive. Fried tells Masaru that he has a proposal about the corpus of the horse. He asks if he could hand it over to them. Without missing a beat Masaru replies that he will have to decline. Just by looking at his face Adelina knows he is up to no good. Masaru explains that although the horse was devoured by the demon bear, the rest of the body is mostly intact, except for the neck. He can assure them that they are high-quality materials. The bones of the legs are strong and sturdy and the skin is smooth so it will make good clothes. He says that its size is not big he finally includes the horn and the expression on Fried's face immediately changes. Masaru thinks bingo. Masaru says that he is a bit reluctant to part with them. To be honest with him, however, he says that if the kingdom's chivalric order is willing to pay extra for it, he would not mind selling it. The star starts to exclaim that how dare he but is stopped when Fried puts a hand in front of his and says what Masaru Dono said is right. Fried says that just as Masaru said all of the materials he has mentioned are worth a lot of money. And of course, he is not saying that he gives it to them for free. Fortunately, there is a bounty for the subjugation. He suggests making a deal. If the price they offer does not match his asking price, they will also include the bounty reward. Masaru weighs that the crux of the problem here is the horn of the horse, it is what the king himself seeks. Also, the knights only care about getting the job done, regardless of the price that they have to pay in other, in other words, fame and authority. It is precisely because they are things that can't be bought with money, that they don't place any importance on monetary wealth. He wonders what he should do. Depending on the negotiation, he can go as far as to rip them off all their money, but the amount of reward money also concerns him. Or maybe it would be in his best interest to go easy with this negotiation and have the kingdom's knights owe him a favor. Suddenly an idea struck him. He got up and requested them to let him accompany them to Gratas. The village chief looks at him in shock as he continues and asks if they would mind testifying for him. And then he will conduct the negotiation himself. He says that if the offer is good then he will gladly accept it. Otherwise, he can just return with the materials. Fried says that the resources that their kingdom is offering will definitely meet his criteria. De Star mutters about the direct audience with the king. Fried says that it is not like they have not directly dealt with and made deals with big shot merchants before. He says that he is fine with the arrangement, but he can't guarantee that the negotiation will be smooth sailing. Nasaru tells them not to underestimate him. He says that he was also formerly a broker during his time at the home center. He claims that it is in his blood. De Star wonders what he is talking about while Fried only smiles stating in that case it is decided then. That said outside after the negotiations he explains to May that when Fried San and his men get enough rest he will have to leave again for a while. May is pouting at him as he tries to explain that the purpose of this trip is purely for business negotiations and there will be no fighting involved. May makes another pouty noise and turns away but he continues that he promises that he will not be doing anything dangerous. Ladalina tells him that instead of making excuses, he should apologize to her. She asks what he is making. He says that he is building the outer walls of a house. He has to get as much work done as possible before he leaves the city. He asks if the delivery beds are finished. Adelina answered that more or less it is already being delivered to the houses in construction at the moment. More importantly, she says about the space near the city's mountain slopes, there is no need to deliver beds there for now. Masaru's eyes sparkle as he says he planned a public bathhouse. 
He spells that it has the potential to become a hot spring too. He frantically exclaims that now that the house bathroom and furniture are done, this is the next step. This step in particular must not be omitted. He announces that as a Japanese guy, it's absolutely a must. Adelina says that it is another vocabulary from Masaru's world. Mei joins her and exclaims how are they supposed to know what he is on about. Masaru calms down and says that to put it simply, it's a huge bath. When this is completed, they can say goodbye to the life of washing our bodies with cold water every day. Mei exclaims this is amazing. He comments that Mei-chan who is angry and excited at the same time is also quite amazing though. Adelina says that just like two-story houses, the bath is also only limited to a number of upper-class families. And she thinks the bath is too big. It would be tough to gather that much firewood in the mountains every day is too big. Masaru says that it is a hot spring. He does not get a reaction so he realizes that they do not know what a hot spring is. He explains that a hot spring is a spring of naturally hot water, typically heated by subterranean volcanic activity. When a hot spring comes out after the ground is dug into, they would be able to channel it and use it to fill the bathhouse. May wonders if this is something they can dig out of the ground. Adelina notices she is back to normal. Masaru says she is right that they dig normally he is pretty sure that only well water comes out. He laughed actually it was by chance that he discovered it after he heard from the rabbit hunters that there was a river of lava nearby. He was able to discover an underground water vein. When he used my skill map to show the 3D geographical map of the area, but he thinks that he could not still figure out a way to start digging. Seriously, he needed to think of something with the skills that he had in his arsenal. But more importantly, Adelina says that she was under the impression that space was for the thing that he is making. He asks what she means and she says that means the goddess's statue and her shrine. She asks if he forgot and exclaims what's with that what a pain in the ass face. He says that he is fine with a statue but asks if a shrine really necessary. Adelina yells that of course it is, she claims that it will be convenient for the goddess to descend, just like during the rainy season. May says that she is right, they have to build the goddess's residence. Masaru says that it is fine the goddess will slack and come here regardless, and says that they should leave it for last. It is better to build the shrine once they are more skilled to do so. Adelina says that she has no complaints if they are going to build it. He says that they don't have to worry too much, he will just ask the goddess about it. Suddenly the portal appears and the goddess descends to the ground. A voice calls out saying that she would not mind doing it now. She greets Masaru and exclaims that she skipped her work to come to visit him. He tells her that she has great timing as always. Suddenly he is punched in the face. Adelina claims that this is the goddess herself and she asks why is he dropping the honorifics. The goddess sees them fighting but gets up the courage to step in between. She floats in the air as she says that it is alright as she calls him a chosen one. He is also her envoy so his rude behavior is pardoned. Adelina exclaims that goddess Sama is so benevolent. She says that the goddess's compassion is just as the legends depict. Masaru asks what brings her here and pulls out both Mei and Adelina from their stupor. Victinius says that she has a promise with a certain someone and it just so happens that she wanted to introduce her to him and have a chat without using the status screen message. Another goddess appears and introduces herself as Isla Safira. Isla Safira, Masaru recognizes that she is Victinius's sister. She says that thanks to Masaru Sama's efforts, she and her sister are looking forward to seeing the development of this world in the foreseeable future. Masaru thinks as expected, from her way of speaking and conduct, she seems to be an intelligent and pure goddess, just like in the letter. He looks at Victinia's and wonders if they really are sisters. Oblivious to his rude thoughts she asks what is wrong he simply brushes her off. Masaru says that it is a pleasure meeting her. Moreover, he says that there is something he would like to talk to you about. Isla asks if anything is troubling him. He tells her about the magic that was mentioned in the message before. He says that he with an idea. Victinia's calls out to them catching both of their attention. She requests them to leave the difficult discussion for later. He tells them to start with a simple chat first. She calls out to Isla, and Isla says that she understands. She pulled out a table set from the portal and told everyone to take a seat. All the humans in May look surprised at that. Masaru hesitantly asks if she just used the dimensional storage skill. The number of cups and seats that she summoned and arranged perfectly match with the number of people here. Isla says that there is a misconception that this is a skill only used to take out or put away items at will. She states that in this world, there are no absolutes. Skills should be used in a variety of ways that suit the user. Masaru repeats that what she is saying is that one's common sense can interfere with a skill's manifestation. But he says that it is not like he can do anything about it even if he is aware. She exclaims that he is mistaken. 
She reminds him that he is using production skills innovatively himself. She tells him that it is precisely because of his accomplishments that she hopes he can continue being the pioneer of magic development. Victinius interrupts saying that they are talking about complicated topics again. She says that they should be discussing about her statue first. Masaru says that he wants to ask the opinion of the person herself and asks if a statue really necessary. Both Victinius and Isla exclaim that of course, it is necessary. Victinius reminds him that during the rainy season, she told him that she was looking forward to it. Isla says that it is correct and she can't wait to see hers as well. Masaru exclaims that he has to make a statue for the younger sister as well. Victinius tells him to start working on it if he understands. He tells her that she will have to wait until after he returns from the capital. He says that in the meantime, he needs some pictures for reference. A screen appears in front of Victinius as she says that if he is alright with some of the pictures that she took recently, she will send them to him using the status screen. But she says that she only has frontal shots of herself, and Isla replies the same. Masaru suggests picking one for them. She shows him a screen he taps on the one that says Zeus Sama's Punishment Game, which shows Victinia's in a particularly revealing outfit with tears in her eyes and bears glasses on her hand. Masaru takes his chance and sends it to his status. He tells him not to look but it is too late. She sees him sending it to himself and yells for him to delete it right now. He runs away and yells that with all due respect, he declines and says that it would be a waste not using it as material. Then smirks and suggests telling him the numbers directly. He says that he would not need this picture anymore if she did. She asks what those are and he replies that her three sizes. Victinius blushes deep red as Masaru continues that it is all for the sake of the statues. Not that he minds either way though, but he gleefully adds that everyone ought to contribute in one way or another, so it would be great if she had more pictures. Victinius now fully flustered says that she can't believe that he would resort to these underhanded methods to divulge a maiden's secrets. Isla claims that this is unforgivable and shameless. Masaru counters that they are more innocent than he thought. Victinius orders Isla to deliver the punishment. Isla gets up raising her hand above her head she creates a huge ball of energy and launches it toward Masaru. He looks at this realizing that this is the real deal. Compared to strengthening magic, the magical power is denser than manifold. He hurries to dodge it, but Adelina worriedly questions if he is still alive. The blast echoed throughout the city. Isla clicked her tongue and announced that Masaru dodged. Adelina comments that he sure has the guts to make a move on the goddess. Even May tells him that he is at fault there. He wonders if that was really his fault. He looks at Isla who looks ready to launch another one of her balls at him. He muses that what happened was solely due to their overreaction. He thinks that they have great figures so he questions why are they that upset. He does not understand the girls. No, a goddess is hard at all. He has no delicacy. The villagers approach and ask what was the noise just now. They ask if something happened. Adelina shouts for everyone to hold their horses and announces that these distinguished guests are Goddess Victinia's Sama and Goddess Isla Sephira Sama. The rabbit people exclaim in awe as they see the goddesses the goddesses of this world have just descended. She explains that the ruckus just now was because of Masaru's rude manners. The rabbit folk comment in awe that the goddesses are so solemn and beautiful. Another one exclaims that this is not good as they might also offend the goddesses like Masaru did. Masaru exclaims that they are digging at him too much. All the people bow and welcome the goddess. Victinius says that she is bad at dealing with this. Isla shyly adds that that's because they aren't used to it and they don't descend to the lower world outside of festive days or ceremonies. After all, he offhandedly tells them to get their act together. Since everyone's here, he suggests getting straight to the difficult topic. Masaru asks that she has a reason to descend. Victinius hesitantly asks him if he remembers the crabs, and if he still has some left, they like to have a taste. Victinius says that she told Isla about the delicious crabs that she ate last time and since they also want to ask him about the statues. Isla backs her up saying that with that pretext they descended to the lower world. Masaru thinks this is too tragic, the younger is also a hopeless goddess like her sister. Masaru sighs and says that it can't be helped. He announces to everyone that he has just received divine instructions from the goddess, Victinia Sama, herself. He says that as of yet, they don't have any products that could be sold to other towns. Therefore, they will start looking for ingredients that have never been seen. Victinius tells him to hold on but Masaru says that it is okay as things are going to be fine. He cleared his throat and said that for the first step, let's work on expanding the vacant land in the mountainside area so that they can start developing farms and plantations. He says that they will be building them all over the city so their food supply is safely secured. He says that first, they will split half of the building team 
to conduct surveys of the surrounding vegetation. He instructs that they have to make distinctions between poisonous, inedible, and edible plants, and if there are things that they don't understand, he tells them to ask him or the gathering team. He announces that this is the request of the goddess. Victinia's sulks saying that she did not request anything like that. He asks what is the matter as she says that she wants to eat delicious things. Moreover, he says that this is the first step to becoming self-sufficient. He was thinking of building sample plantations sooner or later anyway. Victinia's comments that he has thought this through, but she says that building plantations throughout the city will be hard. Masaru says that this is not true at all. By building fields between houses, it will help reduce the noises that one can hear from the neighboring house and improve sun exposure, ventilation, and scenery. As for the landscape, he would like to set up gazebos which can be commonly seen in parks as resting spots. A gazebo is a roof structure that offers an open view of the surrounding area, typically used for relaxation or entertainment. He says that gardening was also handled by the home center too. He says they are going to focus on that area. Victinia's that it is lovely, and Masaru continues that they will build her statues and shrines too. The more beautiful this city is, the easier it is for a certain goddess to come and play. She smiles and then asks if he means she can eat crabs every time she comes to play. Isla immediately joins her saying that they will be counting on him. He did make up his mind, to make this a relaxing place or rather, a place where they can visit with a peace of mind. He looks at both the goddesses who are on the verge of tears. He agrees that he will treat them to a crab feast whenever they visit. In exchange he asks both of them a favor. Both protectively ask home what he is up to, and Isla exclaims that he wants to know by feeling them. He yells at them to let it go. He tells Isla that he wants to ask her something about magic. He mentioned it before when they first met. Isla says that she got it and tells him to talk about it in detail after they have their crab. Victinius asks what about her. Victinius, he tells her that he will send her a message when the time comes. She comments how shady, she says this beforehand but she won't be meddling too much. He says that it is no problem, she just has to come when she receives his message. He is going to head to the capital after Fried San and his men recover. If business negotiations go wrong, then it will be necessary to have the goddess of victory as the trump card. A few days later, at the capital of Gratis, Distar is kneeling in front of the king as he speaks that his servant, Distar, under the command of the king's guard, return frayed ringing his majesty. Their remaining troops will return to Gratis tomorrow. The king tells him that doesn't matter and just gets straight to the point. He asks if they were able to get their hands on the mutated beast's horn. Two weeks later, Masaru says that he did not expect him to arrange for a carriage to pick him up. He is standing in front of the entrance of the city. The guard says that it is as expected of the capital a five-star service. Masaru exclaims that this is not the point he exclaims that the capital is way too far. It took seven days, and he is exhausted. Fried says that is because he decided to run here. There is a carriage prepared but he protested and refused to get on it. He exclaims that his butt hurts sitting on that carriage. Freyd says normally speaking, one would not just get off the carriage and decide to run instead with that reasoning. He says that they are finally here at the Grotta's Kingdom, Main Avenue. Freyd says that the capital is the most powerful country on the continent. After making a promise to the goddess, Wash Freyd and his men made a full recovery, and they traveled to the capital together. His business partner will be the king of the human race. In other words, the main culprit who was behind the expulsion of the beast men from the port city. To be honest he planned on taking the occasion to get back at him but he remembers the village chief telling him that it is not necessary. He told him to go ahead and proceed with the deal as he saw fit. Masaru says that the other party is someone who robbed him of his home and turned him into a slave. The village chief says that understands Masaru's feelings, just like what he said to Fried. There also exist people like him amongst them. The other party might have had no choice but to expand their own territory for the sake of their people. And of course, they have our own reservations but it is what it is. He says that grudges hate and envy. It is unnecessary to fill the children in this town with negative sentiments. The village chief says he would only ask for one favor during negotiation. It is that he keeps everyone's interest in mind. Well, it is precisely because of the character of the rabbit folks that made him want to assist them. Fried calls out if he is listening to him. Masaru apologizes saying that he was distracted. Fried continues that as he was saying, they have several things that we need to take care of at the capital. First thing first, regarding the audience with the king. He has already sent Distar back first to relay the news, so he tells Masaru to head to the castle. Masaru looks around and says that he has never seen this fruit before. He says that he has to buy a stock of them when they return. Fry's requests for him to just listen. 
but Masaru tells him not to worry as he hears loud and clear the first time and they will meet the king first. Fired says that he is glad he understood. More importantly, he says that he will go through the formalities before the audience with the king. In the meantime, he asks if he could wait somewhere. Masaru says that if that is the case, Fried shows him the Adventurer Guild. He asks why does he wants to wait here, and questions if he has any business at the Adventurer's Guild. Masaru snarls and replies that he is right, there is something he needs to know before going face to face against the king. He walks inside and sees several people or rather adventurers on the table. As expected of the capitals guild it is filled with people who give off the vibes of a veteran knight. He asks if this is the receptionist. She welcomes him to the adventurers guild and asks if he wants to put up a request or if he is looking to take on a quest. He has always wanted to try working as an adventurer. She is taken aback by the weird reply and asks why he is there for. He steps closer and says that he says that he happens to hear that a one horned and mutated beast has appeared. He would like to know about the market price of that mutated beast, along with a few other monsters. She tells him to head over to the next counter to have your questions answered. A male receptionist appears and says that he heard the conversation. He wants to know about the market price of mutated beasts, and monsters. He mutters that it's as if he already has the materials ready. He laughs and says that those are common questions for a newbie adventure, after all. Masaru plays along saying that it is just as he said. He says that first the monsters. For materials of normal monsters, they buy them at a price of 100 bronze coins, or a silver coin. For monsters that can use magic, their prices are a little higher. They cost around 100 silver coins, which is equivalent to a gold coin. And if they dragon class monsters the starting price is 100 gold coins. Because they are monsters that mutate from magical elements they are quite rare. And the strength of mutated beasts vastly differs from normal monsters. They are so strong that even the king's guard platoon of 200 men would find it difficult to deal with. The value of their materials are so high that wars have been fought over them. The guild also purchases them sometimes, but most of the materials are auctioned at the merchant association. Just a teach of a mutated beast would cost around sands of gold coins. Based on what he said, Masaru supposes that a bronze coin equals a single yen. He exclaims that it is based on what he said. Masaru exclaims that it is around 100 million. The receptionist taunts that it is as if he is shocked to find out that the materials he possesses are worth a ridiculous amount of money. Masaru says that it is nothing. He asks if they can tell him about the specific market prices of the individual parts. Fried asks what he did you do at the guild. He comments that he has been disgustingly giggling to himself ever since they left. Masaru replies that nothing much he was just able to obtain some information. So now he is really looking forward to meeting the king. That's all. Fried tells him to just promise him one thing and not cause any trouble. Masaru thinks that it is not like he does it on purpose. He grumbles why does everyone assume he is a troublemaker. They reach the entrance of the giant gates and he instructs Masaru to leave his belongings here. Fried tells the royal guards about their presence. The guard announces that before them is the presence of the king. Fried of the king's guard his majesty graces him with his presence. The doors open and before them, his majesty sat on his throne. Masaru thinks this is the king of the human race, of this world. He tells himself to get his act together. He can't afford to show his weakness. Fried kneels as soon as he is in front of his majesty. Besides he has a card up his sleeves. The king's attendant reminds him that he is under the king's presence and tells him to kneel. He simply refused. Masaru tells them his name leaving the attendant to squirm under his audacity. But the king pays along saying that he is the king of Gratas, ruler of the human race, action. He says that he likes that boldness of his and his insolence is pardoned. As for why, it is because the king is in particularly a good mood today. Therefore, but he warns Masaru to be careful that if his good mood is ruined then he won't be able to imagine the consequences. That makes Masaru pause as the king asks Fried for his report. After listening to the report his majesty concludes that the beast men are building a city in the mountains. They successfully defeated the mutated beast, and Masaru was tasked with bringing the materials of the one-horned mutated beast here. He praises Fried that he did a great job. Masaru pulls the head of the beast out of his item box. He asks the king if this is the head of the one-horned mutated beast. He exclaims that this is exactly the one-horned mutated beast, there's no mistaking it. He had half given up on it, but this was an unexpected blessing. He exclaims that Masaru shall be rewarded handsomely. The attendant requests Masaru to offer the head of the one-horned mutated beast to the king. Masaru innocently asks what is he talking about and he refuses. He says offering the head of the one-horned mutated beast is not how this works. He smirks and tells them that he brought it here so it is his. He states that he wants to conduct a trade, not make an offering. 
The king thinks that it is interesting and asks if he wants to negotiate with him. Masaru replies that he will gladly give up what the king wants but if that is the case, he asks him to consider this a favor for him. The king says that the subject should look up to their liege, for that is the natural order of things. And if a subject wants to be on equal footing with him, then he also would not mind them pushing their limit but to look down on their liege is sacrilegious. He gets up from the throne and starts walking down towards Masaru. Masaru thinks it is scary and feels the pressure that is not the same as Lancelot. He suddenly bows and apologizes confessing that he went too far with his words. He continues that it's true that being a king is not only about governing the land and ruling the people. A king is an unfathomable existence, after all. The king says that it seems like Masaru is not completely ignorant. He says that it is just as he said, a king is an existence loved by the gods. It is a superior being, so to speak. The king eases back into his throne. Suddenly Masaru rides and tells him that a little bird, who told him that during his coronation, he was so nervous that he even stumbled over his own name many times. He smirks saying that it was an interesting story. The king stands up again and walks down the aisle until he is standing right in front of Masaru. He asks Masaru how does he know that? A commoner like him. He says that only the captain of the king's guard and a few of his annoying relatives are at the coronation. He winks at him, reminding him that it was a little bird that told him that. A portal starts to open behind him and he points at it, announcing to start of the main show. The king's eyes widen as the goddess walks out of the portal. She says that she is here to fulfill her promise. All the people in the royal court stood still in shock as the goddess appeared. She continues as she recites what Masaru told her. Just come when he calls her, she doesn't have to do anything. She tells him that he is taking the goddess too lightly. The king is shell-shocked he wonders what on earth is going on and who is this man. He witnessed the heavenly figure of the goddess herself when he was 30 years old. He questions why the goddess is here, in his castle and why is she with this brat. And why are they having a tea party together in front of his eyes? They continue to chatter on as the goddess says that after that Hirasama praised her. She said that the development of her world is progressing really well. He tells her to give him a little credit too, but he guesses it is fine since she is the one who ice skied him. She asks what is with him, that if he really thinks that way then, when she is in a good mood he should be happy for her. Then she adds that Isla asked her to tell him that. She is already working on his request. She shows him the image she sent. The king in the back freaks out at how close they are. He sees the picture where Isla is teaching magic to Rabbit's children. He says that she is already working on it without him having to remind her. He comments that she is a good goddess after all, unlike a certain good-for-nothing goddess. This makes the goddess beside him sulk as she mumbles that wouldn't be her. Changing the subject she asks what is she doing in the lower world. He explains that he made a different request to Isla. She descended to help him with his request. She says that would make her meddle too much in mortal affairs. He says that they thought of ways to do things in moderation. She tells him to tell her about it but he retaliates saying she, as a goddess should figure it out herself. They both do not notice the king sigh until he exclaims and requests their moment. Ventisha quickly changes into her god mode and apologizes saying that it has been a while since she had descended so she was too absorbed in her conversation with her Masaru. She greets the king action finally, king of Gratas. She says that he was still a young man when they last met, commenting that time sure flies. The king says that this is not the issue here. He says that he is honored to meet his goddess again but he has a question he would like to ask her. He asks what is her relationship with Masaru. She says that they share a superior, subordinate relationship. She says that he can say Masaru is her apostle. She comments that he's been getting carried away recently. He says that he does not want to hear that from a slacker. She says that she is here on his behalf so it doesn't count. He says that she is completely enticed by the crabs and that is what she is here for. The king concludes that in other words, Masaru is a messenger of God. He asks if he is related to gods. Masaru answers that he is just an average Joe. He is a human just like him, a perfectly normal human being. He wonders why did he came to that conclusion. The outcome is a bit out of his expectations he can't just tell him that he is a transmigrator. He asks the goddess standing beside him to explain to him in a way that is easy to understand it. He says that something like this would not count as excessive meddling. She eventually ends up saying that they are friends. The king is shocked that a mortal is actually friends with a god. Masaru tells her that this will do it, this is the most reasonable outcome one can hope for. On, but the goddess herself is a bit confused now. A friend or follower, he is building her statue, after all. Masaru grimaces he wants to ask her where she got that belief from. Suddenly an idea stuck with her, she told Action to arrange some materials for Masaru. Might as well use the best materials she is gloss she made a trip till here. 
the king agrees without a second word, whereas Masaru tells her to stop. She argues that it is all for the sake of her beautiful statue. He tries to tell her that he is doing business with the king and can't afford to do that. No one would be able to refuse the request of a god. In other words, Hira suddenly appears out of a portal with a tick mark on her head as she says that she is overstepping her authority here. Hira grabs her and pulls her back into the portal. But Victinius does not forget to remind Masaru of his end of the deal. He turns to the king and apologizes for the display. The king on the other hand can't believe that the goddess has a human friend. He dismisses everyone, saying that he wants to be alone with Masaru. He asks Masaru if he has anything else in store. Masaru says that he feels like he is always being taken advantage of as her friend. As Victinius mentioned earlier, he has decided to build a statue for her and prepare a feast of crabs for her whenever she descends. The king asks if he could build another statue in his country too. He adds that the skill of a man who is trusted by the god surely would suffice. Masaru asks if he is making a deal with him, and the king answers that he is making a deal with him. To pay his respect to the gods he shall personally enter into this negotiation. But he adds that he has a condition. He hopes that Masaru will not refuse to sell it to him. He says that he must get his hands on it, no matter the cost. Masaru asks why would he go this far to obtain the horn of the one-horned mutated beast. The king answers that it is because of this scepter is said to have been carved out of the horn of the one-horned mutated beast, by the founding king himself. Therefore, the one-horned mutated beast could be said to share a bond with his country. It is a long-standing tradition that a new scepter is given to the succeeding king. The king says that he is already past his prime therefore he wants to make preparations for when the time comes. He does not know when the next mutated beast will appear. He states that generations of kings have performed this duty without fail, and he, as a king, must also do his part. Masaru says that he understood and tells him to proceed with the negotiation. However, he thinks something is off about the white scepter. He asks the king if this is the staff of his predecessor, and the king says that this is the staff of the founding king. When he grabs the scepter and uses his appraisal skill on the scepter and it says that the scepter of the kingdom of Gratas is a staff made from the horn of a unicorn that the founding king single-handedly defeated. When, grounded into a powder, it can detoxify various poisons. He tells the king that this is made from the horn of a unicorn not from the horn of the one-horned mutated beast. Just as he thought, the king frantically asks how does he knows that. Masaru answers that he can use the appraisal skill. So he is a hundred percent sure that this scepter is not made from the horn of the one-horned mutated beast. Masaru says that this means the deal is off, but the king asks if he is not lying. The king says that he knows the value of the one-horned mutated beast, so he is trying to pull the wool over his eyes. He accuses him saying that perhaps he had changed his mind about selling it and that is why he is trying to deceive him. Masaru says that negotiation is where both parties find common grounds to aim for the best outcome. He says that he would never take advantage of his partner's trust. He says that he can swear by the name of Victinus, the goddess of this world whom his people believe in. The king says that he can tell what kind of person he is. It is common knowledge to deceive and be deceived in negotiation. He says that he will place his trust in him and buy the horn. Masaru looks shocked at that and king continues that it is because he does not exactly need the horn anymore he will only pay the market price. Masaru replies that he does not mind since will get a lot of money, but asks if he is sure. It will still cost him an about arm and a leg. The king explains that the materials of a mutated beast are very precious to begin with. Just by possessing it would boost one's prestige. Besides, if it is an item that he obtained from a negotiation with a friend of the gods, his will also spread across the land. Masaru says that if he puts it that way he seems to reap a lot more benefits compared to him. Nonetheless, he shakes the offered hand and says that it is a deal. Masaru says that he still wants to continue the negotiation. Since this is the capital, he probably has a lot of stocks. He thinks that this is actually the main part. He says that he would like to purchase his surplus stock. The king says that is negotiable but he has to attend to other matters. He suggests they continue this discussion at a later date. He asks if Masaru is planning to stay for a while. Masaru answered that it was no problem. He planned to go on a tour around the capital and stay for a few days to buy some supplies anyway. The king says that if that is the case then he will assign someone to guide him around the capital. That would also make it easier for him to contact Masaru. He states that he has the perfect candidate in mind, a knight who is a bit different from the norm. Later Fry leads Masaru to Zack, his knight in a library. He calls out to him and Zack comes out in a matter of seconds. He apologizes that his hands are a bit tied with an important deal at the moment. Fried says he will make it short. Masaru wonders if a knight is doing an accountant's job. 
he wonders if he is a knight who is well versed in the library area. Fried tells him to relax as they are only here to ask him something. He questions that he is quite gifted in making things. Zack answers he would not go so far as to say he is gifted, he is merely just capable of it, because that is how he was brought up. Fried asks how is and he answers that his father was an ex-engineer, and after he left the army, he operated a workshop in Castletown where he made stones and bricks used for construction. He says that he used to help him out. However, he is interrupted by Masaru who yells at him about a workshop. He affirms Masaru and asks Fried who is he. Instead of answering Masaru shows a paper in Zack's face and tells him that he is the perfect guy for the job. He tells him to look that this is the recommendation letter from the king and tells him that he is Masaru and he will be in Zack's care during his stay in the capital. In addition, he will also be staying in the workshop. He adds that he will be counting on Zack. Zack merely laughs and asks what is he talking about. Zack says they got the gist of the situation. Masaru tells him to only call by his name and tells him to drop the formal language and speak to him like a friend would. Zack says that he does not mind giving him a tour around the capital, but asks why did he decide to stay at his home. Masaru says that he is interested in the bricks, and adds that he might get a discount purchasing them if he introduces himself as his friend. Zack says that he is too direct. Masaru persuades saying that it is fine there is a saying that the customer is king after all. Zack questions why has he never heard of it. He says that having a customer would really help out. Masaru wonders what he means. Zack points to a small area and says that there is his store. Both Masaru and Zack are standing in front of Zack's workshop which looks like a broken hut in a run-down apartment. Masaru exclaims what happened here. This store is a mess he questions if this is some sort of ruin. He sort of understood what he meant just now. Business is probably not going too well. Zack says that it is not what it looks like. His father has been giving it his all. Masaru grabs a brick thinking that the bricks here are not bad. The fired bricks have been burnt properly. He tries appraisal on it and finds that it is a high quality brick. A building material made of clay, shale, and mud that has been molded and burnt in a kiln has a high success rate. He is impressed by the quality of the brick. He notices that the logs at the side are in the orderly, stones are cut into the same sizes. He thinks Zack's father is quite skilled, but aggressively thinks that he is absolutely clueless. Clueless about the basics of business. He tells Zack to let him meet his dad. He claims that he has to give him a lecture first before they get into business. He agrees saying that he is probably burning bricks behind the store right now. They walk behind the store and Zack calls for his father. He says that there is a customer. He is a loud noise coming from behind the door his father yells at him to keep it down already. He tells him to stop calling him informing him that he is inside. They open the door and see the man leaning against the table. Masaru thinks that after he transmigrated, he is finally, no, this is probably the was able first time, that he was able to meet a skilled craftsman. Zek asks what is wrong and why is he not burning bricks like usual. He says that he is obsessed with bricks and asks if he is not feeling well. His father burst out that there was no money left. He tells him to forget about the money for bricks, they don't even have enough to put food on the table tomorrow. Masaru realizes that this man is the classic example of a good-for-nothing father, the type that does not give a damn about anything as long as he is able to pursue his passion. Zack says that this doesn't make any sense. He questions what happened to the workers and asks where is his disciple. His father answers that all of them ran off with the money last month. After all he did not pay them their wages for three months. His son questions why is he so proud of it. Zack is still in shock and inquires where is his sister and how could she let this happen. His father offhandedly says that she is not home. He tells her that she said she is going to do everything she can to earn money. Zack wordly asks if she is selling her body. His father brushes him off saying that she went to work at the rival workshop. Meanwhile, Masaru is looking around the shop like he is on a hunt. Zack happily says that it is great, before punching his father to the ground. Masaru tells him to just calm down and give it a rest. More importantly he asks how much are the bricks in their stock. His father says that he does not know that Diana is not here to do the cashier work. Masaru looks at Zack for answers and he says that she is his elder sister, then turns to father asking how does he runs the store if he does not even know the prices. Masaru says that even if there are a lot of customers frequenting the store, he doubts they would be able to sell the goods here. His father says that those customers have no eyes, that's all. These bricks are the best in the capital he wonders why are they not selling. Masaru answers that that's because the store has a horrible impression. He says that the service industry is built upon the foundation of trust and impression is the most important after all. High quality goods are also important, but to do business in a dirty shop is simply out of the question. 
he tells them that they have to work on their store first or else their products will never get a chance to shine. He lectures that first is to arrange the materials, so customers can know what they have and how much they have with a single glance. With well-organized inventory management, he says that it will make a huge difference in the impression of their customers. His father asks if he is a customer, and Zack answers that he probably is. Then Masaru turns saying that this is all he has for now. He tells Zack that he will stay at an inn today and sleep there. Zack tells him that he will look for his sister to calculate how much much supplies they have. Masaru says that would be great. He suggests meeting again at the castle tomorrow at noon. Zack asks what about that one-horned mutated beast. Masaru says that he will wrap up the one-horned mutated beast deal tomorrow in the morning and complete the rest of the negotiation. The next day at the castle, the king makes him a check of a good amount and says that this is the payment for the one-horned mutated beast and the subjugation reward money. Masaru says that he has been waiting for this. He asks if it is all right for him to take the reward money too. The king agrees saying that he has contributed to the kingdom by subjugating, a beast to keep people safe, therefore he tells him to take the reward. The king declares that with this, the deal is completed. He suggests moving on to the next part of their negotiation. He remembers that Masaru wanted to purchase the surplus supplies. He asks if the amount of supplies and 20% of last year's barley and wheat harvest is acceptable to him. Masaru replies that he is happy with the amount that he is offering. The king says that after they come to an agreement, he will calculate the money together with the previous amount that they had agreed upon. The attendant says that they can also offer other goods like soybeans. Masaru happily requests them to fill him in on the details. Compared to barley and wheat soybeans is not as high a priority, but since they have a lot of them in stock, they offer back and forth. And at last Masaru says that he will purchase all of them and asks how much do they have. He says that most of them are still not ground and unprocessed. They are stored in separate amounts every year. Masaru says that is great and he will buy all of them then. After that they start negotiating about the price. After a while they finally declare that it's a done deal. And negotiation is completed. Masaru exclaims that the negotiation went better than he expected. The king's attendant says that it has been a pleasure doing business with him. He adds that as a matter of fact, it is rare for the king himself to be present at a negotiation like this. Thanks to the occasion, civil servants like ourselves can be more in touch with his majesty and help him better manage the kingdom's internal affairs. He tells him that he should inform him of important matters, even if he is the king, but then adds that as a commoner it is not his place to say. The attendant says that nonetheless, he will keep his advice in mind. When there are supplies in stock they will get in touch with him. Masa asks why did they have this many supples stocked up. The king says that some of them are particularly for disaster relief, but most of them are supplies for army expeditions and military campaigns. Masaru concludes that in other words, invasions, considering the tragedy that befell the rabbit folks in the past, his guess is probably not far off. Masaru thinks out loud what a waste expeditions are unnecessary in his opinion. The king states that this is the thinking of someone who does not have any idea how to rule. The king says that expedition is a must and he is simply doing what he deems necessary to bring prosperity to his realm. Masaru counters that hence his policy of expansion. He says that he got his point but it is also important to consolidate and stabilize his realm. His country might collapse from unrest someday, that is what he thinks. The king comments that a friend of God shows concern for the country's state of affairs. He tells Masaru that there is no need for him to worry about such matters. He says that their opinions differ due to the difference in their points of view, that's all. Masaru agrees stating it is precisely because there are many differences between them. He would like to give him a piece of advice. The king opts to hear. First, as a king, he believes he has to focus on bringing true prosperity to the territories in his country. He says that it is possible for cities to develop and polish, that is without relying on expeditions and invasions. Just like the beast man city that he is currently building. He says that the city is a testament to his words and everyone's standards of living have greatly improved. He tells the king to come pay a visit when the city is built. And he calls the king by his name. He tells him that he can also look at the coast, and he will probably understand what Masaru is talking about when he gets there. Masaru gets up and states that there is always a way to coexist. He hopes that the king can give it a little more thought. He continues that they are all loved by the gods, so he thinks it is better to settle their differences and get along with each other. The king wonders about that he says is expected, that their points of view are too different. Masaru says there is a quick reminder for him, however, if he looks down on those people just because they are an inferior race that doesn't belong to any nation. He gives the king a warning look before turning and announcing that this is it for today. 
He says that he will come to say goodbye when he leaves the capital. He calls out behind telling them to remember to pay in gold coins. And then he leaves. His majesty finally relaxes. He asks his servants if he thinks the choices he has made thus far have been incorrect. He replies that the decisions he has made are for the sake of the people and the country. He says that their kingdom's current state affair is the fruit of his rule. But he says that in his humble opinion, he thinks what Masaru Sama said made sense. The king says that he feels the same. Then he suddenly shoots up saying that Masaru's coming here must be the will of the gods. If what he said is not wrong, then it would be wise to try heeding his advice. He remembers that Masaru mentioned the coastal city, that's where Lancelot is. He tells his servant to make preparations for his visit to the Beast Men city. The man starts to ask about the king's guards but the king interrupts saying that is obvious. There is no need for shields or swords for this special occasion. He tells him to listen to his order, this time they will bring pens. Masaru thanks Zack for coming to pick him up at the castle. Zack comments that he was like a headless chicken in the castle, good thing he was there. Zack says that he seems to be in a good mood and asks if the negotiation was a success. Masaru replies that it was spot on. He bought what he needed and spoke what was on his mind, and it could not go any better than that. Zack comments that he sure is fearless when he heard that Masaru spoke his mind to his majesty. Masaru asks if he brought his sister back. Zack tells him that she is doing the accounting work right now. Before entering he warns Masaru in advance not to act rashly in front of his sister. Masaru bursts and asks why is he always being told not to be rash. Zack comments that he is worried about that talkative mouth of his. He claims that he is a person who acts logically. Besides he is a guest today, so he says there is nothing to worry about. He calls out to his sister telling her that they have arrived. His sister is sitting in the chair as she greets them. Masaru apologizes for barging in. His sister replies that she does not mind and is happy to have him. He asks if she is in the middle of accounting. He says that there are a lot of supplies here. Diana says that this is a warehouse that her father bought on his own accord. She has to calculate the supplies at the store too so it is taking more time than she thought. She says that she will be done soon and tells them to take a seat inside. Masaru asks if he can take a look around the house. She says that he can make himself at home. He looks around the place and thinks that this place is packed with supplies. He gets excited just by looking at all of it. There is surprisingly a lot of handcrafted materials here. He shall put everything here into good use. He takes a place in his hands and asks if this is steel before knocking and realizing it is ceramic. She looks at it and says that that plate is a little special. She informs him that her father invented it when he was still a soldier. It is light and sturdy, but the production cost is too expensive so it was not too popular. She states that the materials are rare too so it is difficult to mass produce them. He hesitantly asks if she is sure it is difficult to mass produce. He points at the bundle of them and asks to explain that. She furiously starts to scribble something and says that she already kicked him out of the house yesterday because he tried to mortgage the house. He comments that they sure have it rough. She sighs and adds that they still have debt too. Zack mutters that if only there is a big customer. His sister adds that then they might even be able to clear their dad's debts too. Masaru thinks he can afford to buy everything in the store. A big customer to deal with the debts. Diana asks what he thinks and Masaru tells them that he has something he needs to talk to them about. First of all, if he buys everything here, he asks if he will get a discount. Zack perks up saying that of course, he will get a discount. He says they will be able to pay off their debts if all the goods here can be sold. He exclaims this is a blessing. Masaru declares that this matter is settled then, and he will buy everything here in exchange he tells them to listen to his proposal. Zack comments that he is a bit embarrassed saying this but he really does not have a good feeling. Masaru assures him that with his circumstances, he will love what Masaru is about to say. He turns to his sister and asks what they should do his sister decides to hear Masaru out first. Masaru suggests that they along with their father move to his city. Zack exclaims that he knew his proposal was going to be ridiculous. He says that Masaru is telling them to leave their home in the capital. He says that his after is fine but then he looks at his sister. His sister asks Masaru if the city he speaks of is a beast man city that he is currently building. Masaru says that she is correct and that she will decide to move there to help them with the construction of the city. And of course, there will be benefits, they will be guaranteed three meals a day, and as far as work is concerned, there will be no limit to what they can do. In addition, their father will get his own workshop and helpers to assist him in making bricks. Zack points out that those conditions are way too favorable to them. Diana says that she is not discriminating but not only it is a place we aren't familiar with, it is also a city without many humans. Masaru says that there is no problem at all. At the moment, the only human living in the city is a girl called Adelina. 
but as time passes, he will be inviting more and more human craftsmen to the city. He asks them if they know any craftsmen who have financial difficulties. He says that he will get permission from the king himself to hire them. Then he creepily adds that this way, they can be more at ease, and he will also be able to secure even more manpower. Zack tells him that he is making an evil face. Masaru says that he just thinks that this is going to be exciting, that's all. He gleefully says that if there is more manpower, it will be greatly beneficial to the development of the city. Zack makes a face as though he does not really get it. He continues to tell them the truth if they don't possess the required skill or knowledge. It is going to be very difficult to learn new techniques and theories in the city. With that said he requests them to think about his proposal. Back to the topic, he tells them that if they give him a 10% discount, then it is a done deal. The siblings declare that they will gladly take that deal. About the payment, he asks if he can pay everything in gold coins. He says that if he could pay back their debts and the remaining amount in gold coins, then that would help him out a lot since he would not have to carry that much gold back on his way back. Both the siblings look at him in shock. They rush that if it is all right with him, they can do that right away. Zack yells at his sister to head out. Masaru says that he is fine with that but they seem to be in a hurry. Dana looks down and says that before their dad causes any more trouble, it is better to settle the debt as soon as possible. Zack confesses that they are scared that he will do something like buy a warehouse again behind their backs. Listening to that Masaru also hurries and tells them to lead the way. Masaru says that he is starting to have a bad feeling about this. An angry man opens the door exclaiming that they are closed already. Diana stands in front of him and he recognizes her as the lady from the brick shop. He says that she seems to be in a hurry and asks if she needs money again. He says that unfortunately, they don't have any more money for her to borrow. But then he looks at Diana who is huffing in heavy breath from running and puts down a bag of money saying that if she insists. In an instant, Masaru and Zack were in front of him instead of Diana as Zack threatened that if he dared lay his hands on his one chan, then he will not let him off so easily. Masaru is just as aggressively saying that they are only here to pay back your money. He asks what is wrong with him. After counting his money, he says that it is unbelievable that Brick Shop actually made so much money. Diana asks if this much is enough to pay back their debt and interests. Zack exclaims that thank goodness they can finally escape from the spiral of debt. However, the shopkeeper says that did a great job gathering this much but it is still not enough. Diana asks if their father borrows more money on his own accord. She asks how much they still owe. He tells both of them to calm down. He says this might still be related to their father. He asks if they remember that warehouse they rented. Zack exclaims that there should be no problem with that warehouse. He says that their father remodeled that warehouse without permission or making a hole in the ceiling to make a bedroom. The amount here isn't enough to compensate for that. All three slump. Masaru thinks that his intuition was right. Zack exclaims that he thought it was weird not seeing him at home or at the store, so that was what he was up to, that good-for-nothing father. Diana says that there is no point in crying over spilled milk. Masaru suggests fixing everything back to how it originally was. The shopkeeper says that he does not mind and they are more than welcome. Masaru exclaims that he is exhausted. He is mentally drained from cleaning that old man's mess the whole day. Dana apologizes to him saying that he is actually not a bad person. Masaru stretches saying he just happens to know a solution to relieve some stress. Zack repeats and tells him not to cause any trouble in the capital. Masaru says that sounds like a great idea but there's an easier way. Zack asks what on earth is he up to. Masaru simply replies that it is shopping. He will shop to his heart's content at this town. He says they will feel refreshed when they go on a shopping splurge. Zack says that if anything, he is going to get even more anxious instead. Diana asks if this is for the beat men city. Masaru says only half of it, and the other half is actually for himself. Diana probes if that is related to the topic this afternoon, about recruiting the craftsmen. Masaru says that he is really looking forward to it. He says that it is a city under construction, and it still has not been named. If craftsmen are willing to come and settle down there, it will really help the city's development. And if he brings in high-quality goods, the city's industry can flourish. And as time passes, the city can become a metropolis that can even surpass the capital. He talks about all the possibilities. He can't wait to go back and continue building the city. Diana says that will be a tough hurple to climb compared to their father's business the scale is just too high. Masaru replies that of course, it will be tough. But he smiles and says that taking part in building is hella fun. If not, why would he even bother spending so much effort? At that moment he looked just like her father when he said that he would leave the shop's financial affairs to her as he was satisfied with just making bricks. Zack asks what is wrong she turns to him and smiles saying that nothing is wrong. 
She asks if Masaru will be going to the shop he replies that he will go in the morning. She asks him before that to pass by the shop is Zack and she will show him around the castle town's marketplace. And while they are at it they can also introduce him to their acquaintances who are also craftsmen. Masaru says that he can meet them face to face that way too. Zack warns her sister saying that Masaru is even more eccentric than their father. She is sure it would be fun hanging around the castle town with Masaru. Zack says that tomorrow is going to be another busy day. Diana smiles at them as the bicker about tomorrow's preparations. 